protection are affected by this amendment. In conclusion, I believe this to be a common sense solution for what is often a very difficult issue, and I urge all of my colleagues to support this amendment. And I'd be happy to yield to my colleague, Mr. Doyle from Pennsylvania. I thank Mrs. Capps. Uh, this is a this is a very, very emotional issue, and there there's strong feelings uh, on both sides of this issue uh, by all the members of this committee and and by the Congress. And what we've tried to do here, uh, in this instance, is preserve the status quo and a, and a long-held principle that I think all Americans share, whether they consider themselves pro-life or pro-choice, and that is that we not use federal tax dollars to pay for abortion. Uh, this amendment preserves that status quo. No federal funds can be used to pay for abortion except in the case of rape, incest, or the life of the woman. No pro-life doctor or hospital or even insurance plan can be required to participate in abortion services. No one, not the secretary, not the benefits committee, and not the commissioner, can make abortion a part of the minimum benefits package. Private plans in the exchange can choose to provide coverage for abortion or not. It's their decision. No public funds may be used to pay for abortions that are not allowed under the Hyde Amendment. The only funds that may be used to pay for other abortion services are funds that come from the policyholders' policy own premiums. Public money is specifically prohibited from being used for other abortions. The Secretary may choose to allow the public plan to cover abortions not allowed by Hyde, but if they do that, they must be paid with private funds. No public funds can be used. No state laws are, are affected about abortion coverage funding, uh, procedural requirements, parental notification or consent. We preempt no state laws and no federal laws affected on conscience protection or refusal to provide or pay for abortions. The Weldon Amendment is specifically cross-referenced. Moreover, in this, the Weldon Amendment is extended to cover private plans in the exchange. That's a protection beyond current law. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as th I said, this is an emotional uh, debate. Uh, this gives us a, a common ground that I think all Americans uh, can support, and that is to make sure that we have a policy uh, that makes sure that no federal tax dollars will be used to fund any abortions. And I yield back the time. Gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Chairman. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Pitts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This um, so-called compromise is uh, an effort to try to get pro-life votes, but it, this is not a pro-life amendment. The, the pro-life caucus chairman will subsequently offer a real pro-life amendment that will continue the current policy of not mandating or providing taxpayer funding for elective abortions. Uh, this amendment departs from the long-standing federal policy of prohibiting funding for plans that include abortion. The long-standing federal policy is no federal funding for plans that include abortion. And this policy has been applied to Medicaid, it's been applied to the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, to the military, to the Indian Health System. The CAPS amendment departs from this long-standing policy and instead creates an accounting scheme by which taxpayer subsidies, uh, called affordability credits, if you will, will go to plans that pay for elective abortion, both the public plan and private plans, whether or not the Hyde Amendment continues in force. Now, the, the amendment incorporates a two-step strategy that will result in funding abortion on demand through the public plan and, and the subsidized private plans. As long as the Hyde Amendment is part of the annual HHS appropriations bill, the CAPS Amendment, allows the Secretary of HHS to cover elective abortion in the public plan. Clearly, Secretary Sebelius will include abortion in the public plan. Once the Hyde Amendment is gutted or changed or its renewal is blocked by a veto threat, federal Medicaid will again fund elective abortions and the CAPS Amendment mandates that the public plan do so as well. By voting for this amendment, the committee will be casting a vote in favor of abortion in the government plan and subsidizing public and private plans that include elective abortion. The result 
immediate federal subsidies for plans that cover elective abortion and both public and private that choose to cover abortions. All pro-life groups have come out in opposition to this amendment. Uh, so I would urge the members to look at this, read this very carefully, and oppose the amendment. Gentleman you? Yes. I'd like to ask a question of counsel. If the CAPS amendment is adopted, would the Secretary of Health and Human Services be allowed uh, to cover elective abortions in the public plan? Yes, sir. So this is a sham. Yes, sir. But okay. yes, sir. But no. <laughs> <laughs> Council is supposed to only give guidance as to the law. <laughs> well, he answered correctly, Mr. Chair. <laughs> I'm going to yield back to Mr. Pitts. It's Will the gentleman yield? Yes, I'll yield. Gentlemen, uh, well. Stearns. Uh, can I ask Council something else? Um, does the CAPS amendment cover partial birth abortion? He gave an honest. The CAPS amendment does not begin to describe various procedures. It would allow any, pr any abortion procedure that is currently legal. Okay. Would that mean that under the CAPS amendment what? that uh, partial birth abortion would be covered by taxpayers' dollars? No. Mm -hmm. Under the CAPS amendment, no abortions are covered with uh, taxpayer dollars except those that are allowed under the Hyde amendment. Okay. Um, you know, I think as Mr. Pitts had pointed out, the CAPS amendment is opposed by the national right to life. There's no one else who understands this issue better than them. The U.S. Uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Family Research Council, and every pro-life group in America does not support the CAPS amendment. In fact, the national right to life says, quote, the CAPS amendment is an assault on the longstanding federal policy against tax-funded abortion. A vote for the CAPS amendment is a vote for massive federal subsidies of elected abortion. Couldn't be more clear. So I, I urge my colleagues to vote against the CAPS amendment. Reclaiming my time, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the Hyde Amendment must be adopted annually when we adopt the Labor HHS uh, Appropriations Bill. And if it is not adopted, a different set of circumstances occurs. And I'll yield this time, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Joe. Uh, section. Uh, three lines, nine through 12, clearly gives, uh, it says nothing in this act shall be constructed as preventing the public health insurance option from providing or prohibiting coverage. So just like you said, Secretary Sebelius uh, with this administration clearly will make that uh, part of the public plan with one public plan, the affordability credit, some will get 100 percent, some will get part, uh, only a certain percentage of their paid. Uh, premiums paid by these credits, but nonetheless, uh, whether it's 100 percent or 90 percent or 80 percent, taxpayer money will be going to abortion. This is a faux uh, separation. Gentlemen's time has expired. Further debate? Mr. Gett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to respond to a couple of points. Perhaps I should ask counsel this question. Um, in, in the CAPS amendment, the public plan uh, the administrators allow, or the secretary is allowed to either decide uh, whether or not the public plan will cover abortions. But if, if she or he did, did decide to cover abortions, would any portion of those abortions be paid for by public dollars? No, ma'am. And why is that? Um, the CAPS amendment as drafted requires that, uh, that the private plans and the public plan both segregate a sufficient amount from private policyholder dollars to pay for any abortion coverage that is estimated to be required. Thank you. So, so basically, uh, because the public plan, the way we've set it up in, in, the, in the bill, is to, is to compete with private plans, it will also be taking dollars from private insurance premiums. And the way this, this bill is set up, it says any plan, whether public or private, can offer abortions, but only with private dollars. No federal funds shall be used for any abortions, whether it's under the public or private plan, that, that with federal dollars, except for under the Hyde provisions. And, and I, would, I, I just can't point that out strongly enough. In addition, this bill still allows state laws to, to stand, 
with respect to any kind of uh, restrictions on abortion. It allows current conscience clause provisions to stand. Basically, what this is an attempt to do is say this bill is not abortion. This bill is providing health care to all Americans, and we should let the status quo stand. One well, last thing. You. We just passed the Hyde Amendment last week in the Labor HHS Appropriations Bill. The President didn't threaten to veto it, and none of us voted against it, but yet the Hyde restrictions were in there. They are going to stay in current law, and I will yield to Mr. Doyle. Thank you. And, and I think that's a, a point well taken. Many people were concerned that because Hyde isn't codified in this amendment, uh, that somehow this administration is going to, to strike Hyde. Uh, this administration under President Obama and Speaker Pelosi uh, just had that bill on the floor, and the Hyde Amendment language was made part of that bill, and we all voted for it. So there's, there's no attempts here to do anything to Hyde. I just want to ask counsel one question, because I, I think this needs to make, be made crystal clear. Under the CAPS Amendment, is there any way possible, any loophole, any any way in this amendment that a federal tax dollars could be used to pay for any abortion that isn't the result of rape, incest, or the mother's life in danger? No, sir. No chance. Not legally. No loophole. Not legally. Not a single penny of federal tax dollars to pay for any abortion that isn't rape, incest, or the mother's life in danger. That is explicitly prohibited by the CAPS Amendment. Thank you. I yield back. Um, I'd, also, I'd like to yield now to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Mr. Gitt, I, I heard the debate, and in, in you and both our colleague from Pennsylvania said that we voted for the Labor H bill last week that included the Hyde Amendment, and all of us voted for it. I was wondering how many members on the Republican side voted for the Labor H bill that had the Hyde Amendment in there. Uh, I think that's, we need to, that's the issue we need to look at. Not only does this amendment protect the Hyde Amendment, but it was in the Labor H bill that a number of folks voted no on that last week. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll, I'll yield back. I, I, I'll, yield to, I'll, yield, I'll yield to Mr. Sarbanes. Yeah, I had a question for counsel. Leaving aside the segregation of funds, which would be, I think, an assurance to many people, um, if I read this correctly, even if that was not enough of an assurance to you and you wanted to find a plan in the exchange that did not cover such services, would there be a plan available that didn't even need to get into the segregation issue? Yes, sir. The CAPS amendment as drafted requires the commissioner of the health insurance exchange to assure that there is at least one plan in every premium area that does not cover abortions beyond the Hyde Amendment. So there's two, there's two levels of assurance to those who would be uncomfortable. One is, one is that you can segregate the use of the dollars so that there's no public dollars going to support those kinds of services. But secondly, um, if you didn't even want to be part of a plan where that was happening, there would be at least one option available within the exchange that you could choose. Yes, sir. Okay. I yield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time has expired. Mr. Barton. Mr. Chairman, I want to um, yield to Mr. Stupak. Well, thank you, Mr. Barton. Thanks for yielding. As this debate started off on this amendment, I was really disappointed that the author of the amendment said that somehow we use this as a poisonous pill. For 17 years, even before the author ever came to Congress, I've worked on these amendments. I've never used it as a poisonous pill. We've always based our legislation, and when I've worked with both sides on this issue, on principles, on what our ethics and our morals may be. So it's not a poison pill. Secondly, Early on this year, in January, 180 members, Democrats and Republicans, wrote to the Speaker, wrote to the Head of Appropriations, wrote to the Rules Committee, and said, we've always had riders on there to protect our interests, our beliefs. Please let us have our riders on the amendments, on the, excuse me, on the appropriation bills. We heard nothing. And Commerce Justice State Appropriation, we lost our rider. Financial Services Appropriation, we lost our rider. Yesterday, or earlier this week, the Senate actually took out the Hyde Amendment on federal employees' health benefit package where it has always been. 
So we write a letter, 180 of us, we get no response. Every time we go to the Rules Committee and, Rules Committee and say, keep our riders in place to protect our beliefs and the debate that we want, we are shut down. We are shut down. In fact, on this debate and this bill in particular, before it got going, 20 Democrats said, we want to see some pro-life language. Okay, so here's what we have. Look at, there are two principles that most of us just cannot and will not retreat from. Principles we held before we came to Congress and principles we will have after we leave Congress. Abortion must be explicitly excluded from the scope of any authority anywhere in this bill to define a mandatory benefits package. Secondly, we must preserve the long-standing principles that public funds do not pay for abortion procedures and do not flow to any plan that includes abortion. That is the policy that has long been applied by Congress and until the Senate action to even the Federal Employees Health Benefit Package, which most of you are covered under. The ban on subsidies for abortion coverage must cover the entire bill, including the public option plan and any plans that are purchased with these federal subsidies. Unfortunately, the CAPS amendment fails on these two goals. When I take a look at this amendment, it was just shared with us, if you start taking a look at it, page two, second line, abortion services, federal funds appropriate for Department of, De Department of Health and Human Services is not permitted. So what are you going to go back to a rider every year? We're going to have to try to go back every year and get a rider? You won't even give us an amendment to debate it on the floor, so we're very skeptical of whether or not that really takes care of our language. And then we have the six month before the beginning of the plan of the year involved, whatever that means. And if you go down to uh, page four, bottom of the page, the commissioner shall estimate the basic per enrollee determined on the average actuarial basis. So we're pooling people together, putting them in the plan, and as we spread that cost off for services, including abortion services, we're now gonna spread out the cost or the cost of the plan so it's cheaper and more affordable. That's not a principle I can endorse. This bill, this proposal, does not take in the principles many of us long believed in. We don't do it as poison pills. We do it because we believe in. Mr. Pitts and I have four amendments. We've been very upfront. Number one, no public funds for abortion. Number two, abortion not provided in public option. Number three, the conscious clause, where no one should be forced to form an abortion or help assist in abortion. And number four, no preemptions of state law. They're very simple. Each one goes on less than a page. It's language we've long lived with. I ask we defeat this amendment, let us bring our four amendments, and let us have the clean votes that have been law since about 1976 in this Congress that's long been supported by both Democrats and Republicans. Not on poison pills, not trying to destroy legislation, but because those are principles we believe in and we have to have our votes on it. This amendment falls short. I ask a no vote on the amendment. I yield back to Mr. Barton. I yield the balance of my time back and ask that we go to the vote. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. We'll now proceed to the vote and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Dingell. Votes aye. Mr. Dingell votes aye. Mr. Markey. Aye. Mr. Boucher. Aye. Mr. Boucher votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Aye. Mr. Pallone, aye. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, aye. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, aye. Mr. Supak. No. Mr. Supak, no. Mr. Engel. Aye. Mr. Engel, aye. Mr. Green. Aye. Mr. Green, aye. Ms. Deget. Aye. Ms. Deget, aye. Mrs. Capps. Mrs. Capps, aye. Mr. Doyle. Yes. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, aye. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon votes aye. Ms. Schakowsky. Aye. Ms. Schakowsky, aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez, aye. Mr. Inslee. Aye. Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Aye. 
Mr. Weiner votes aye. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, aye. Mr. Melanson. No. Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, aye. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Space. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, aye. Mr. Braley. Yes. Mr. Braley, aye. Mr. Welch. Yes. Mr. Welch, aye. Mr. Barton. No. Mr. Barton, no. Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Hall, no. Mr. Upton. No. Mr. Upton, no. Mr. Stearns. No. Mr. Stearns, no. Mr. Deal. No. Mr. Deal, no. Mr. Whitfield. No. Mr. Whitfield, no. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shattuck. No. Mr. Shattuck, no. Mr. Blunt. No. Mr. Blunt, no. Mr. Boyer. No. Boyer, no. Mr. Radonovich. No. Mr. Radonovich, no. Mr. Pitts. No. Mr. Pitts, no. Ms. Bono Mack. No. Ms. Bono Mack, no. Mr. Walden. No. Mr. Walden, no. Mr. Terry. No. Mr. Terry, no. Mr. Rogers. No. Mr. Rogers, no. Mrs. Myrick. No. Mrs. Myrick, no. Mr. Sullivan. No. Mr. Sullivan, no. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess, no. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, no. Mr. Gingry. No. Mr. Gingry, no. Mr. Scalise. No. Mr. Scalise, no. Mr. Gordon. Aye. Mr. Gordon votes aye. Mr. Ross. No. Mr. Ross, no. Mr. Markey. Aye. Mr. Markey votes aye. Mr. Barrow. No. Mr. Barrow, no. Mr. Space. Aye. Mr. Space votes aye. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Any member wish to? Mr. Shimkus. Shimkus votes no. Mr. Shimkus votes no. Any member wish to change his or her vote? If not, the clerk will tally the vote and report it. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there were 30 ayes and 28 noes. 30 ayes, 28 noes, the amendments agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I could 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 I ask the clerk to recount, not recall the vote, but just recount the vote, because I I have a different vote count, and I'm not saying you're wrong. I I just would like you to recount it, not retake it, just recount it. Mr. Chairman, I still get 30 ayes and 28 noes. I thought you said 31. Okay. 30 ayes, 28 noes. The amendment oh, is agreed to. Oh, 
Further amendments? Mr. Pitts. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Yeah, where was Murphy? The clerk will report the amendment. It's uh, Pitts 1001. Does the clerk have Mr. Could Mr. Pitts tell us what the division is to that amendment? It's uh, Division A. To A. Okay, thank you. Was she in this? It's the Pitts Stupak Blunt Amendment. We've got it now. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3200 offered by Mr. Pitts of Pennsylvania, Mr. Stupak of Michigan, and Mr. Blunt of Missouri. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. H.R. 3200 will require virtually every individual to have health care coverage that meets the minimum benefit standards. The bill then establishes a new government health board called the Health Benefits Advisory Committee to determine what qualifies as a minimum benefit standard. This committee, chaired by the Surgeon General and in concert with the Secretary of Health and Human Services, will have the power to issue binding decrees on what type of health care coverage individuals must have and employers must provide. History has demonstrated that Unless abortion is explicitly excluded, administrative agencies and the courts will mandate it. For example, the federal Medicaid statute was silent on the issue of abortion, but the administration and the courts deemed abortion on demand to be mandated coverage. In the case of Planned Parenthood Affiliates of Michigan versus Engler, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals explained that Quote, abortion fits within the many of the mandatory categories, including family planning, outpatient services, inpatient services, and physician services, end quote. Some of these same terms, such as outpatient services, inpatient services, and physician services are mandated under this bill. If the courts use such terms to mandate coverage of abortion in the 1970s, they will surely do it again if the administration doesn't do so first. Only this time, the mandates will apply not only to publicly funded health care, but also to private insurance coverage. In fact, any employer who does not provide coverage that meets the minimum benefit standards will pay up to an 8% tax penalty. And any individual who does not have a plan that meets these benefit standards will be forced to pay a 2.5% tax penalty. This means that Americans who do not want a plan that pays for abortion will be penalized for it. My amendment would simply clarify that nothing in this bill can be used to mandate coverage of abortion. Under the current plan system, insurance companies can provide coverage for abortion if they choose, and individuals can purchase plans that pay for abortion if they choose. My amendment would ensure that this remains the case. I ask my colleagues to vote in favor of choice, vote in favor of allowing Americans the opportunity to choose whether or not they want to participate in plans that pay for abortion without having to be penalized for that choice. I urge support for the amendment at this time. I yield to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak. Well, I thank the gentleman for yielding. And again, I would uh, ask that we uh, support this amendment. You know, when we take a look at it, as, as Mr. Pitts pointed out, the Secretary of HHS and the Benefits Advisory Committee will determine the specific mandated services and as we've seen throughout since uh, about 1973 that abortions included in the minimum benefits packages unless it is specifically excluded. And uh, unfortunately, even the president has indicated, indicated that uh, reproductive care is essential basic care, so it's at the heart or it's at the center, the heart of the plan that he's proposing. And when you take a look at it, the National Abortion Federation said that health care reform as a way to increase access to comprehensive, comprehensive reproduction health care, including abortion care for all women. So history has shown us when you don't exclude it, it's included. And that's why the statutory exclusions have been necessary in programs like the SCHIP program and until the Senate acted DRA on the Federal Employees Health Benefit Package. 
So this bill really does a end run, I think, on the current uh, funding restrictions of a Hyde Amendment. So I would ask that uh, we support the Pitts Amendment, and I'll yield back to. Reclaim my time. I'll yield to the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Blunt. Well, I thank the gentleman for yielding. I'm, I'm glad to join he and Mr. Stupak uh, in this amendment. And the amendment uh, clearly does the things that have already been um, well pres prescribed. It would uh, prohibit services that have long been prohibited. There's nothing in this amendment that would be a change of long established uh, federal policy. Uh, it uh, uh, defines in, in, in specific and consistent ways what the essential benefits package could reflect uh, and uh, has been well described. It's one of, uh, of uh, two or three amendments coming up that just simply uh, continue current policy uh, in this area. It has the uh, provisions in it in lines 11 through 16 that should provide the uh, protections that have been provided uh, for uh, for these uh, these services if they do occur, uh, and I uh, urge uh, the adoption of the amendment. Gentlemen's time has expired. Who seeks recognition? Ms. DeGette. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I rise in opposition to this amendment. Um, on, on its face, it might look attractive to say no provision of this act shall impose um, any requirement for provision of abortion, but in fact, uh, when you look at it, particularly in light of the CAPS compromise amendment which was just passed, uh, what this amendment does is it creates a broad restriction against any recommendation that any plan, public or private, should give any woman any choice of abortion services. This is far beyond current law because under current law, which we have preserved with the amendment we just passed, the Hyde Amendment prohibits the use of public funds for abortion except under very limited circumstances. But under current law and under the CAPS Amendment, women could still use their own private funds to choose private insurance that would cover abortion services with private dollars. What this amendment would do would be to apply the Hyde Amendment to insurance companies and to women who private, purchase private insurance with private dollars. It would, it would, it would greatly expand this, this restriction to, frankly, what is still, last I heard, a legal procedure in this country. And, and, and in a weird twist of fate, the other thing that, that it might do, because it would require plans to include the Hyde Amendment, is actually require some institutions um, who, for religious reasons, would not want to cover abortions to cover them. So it, it really is, um, it's not necessary, and it goes far, far beyond current law. And I'm happy to yield to... Um, I haven't spoken on this issue, and I'd like to weigh in on something. I, I want to speak of, of two things, first out of humility and then out of constitutionality. And at first, I want to speak out of humility. It's very difficult on this issue knowing the great men and women on this body who each have intense personal views about the relative morality of a woman's right of choice. And I approach this in great humility, understand these, the sincerity and how powerfully people feel about their own morality. And it seems to me in that moment of humility, the only refuge we can have as a group is to follow the law. It is the only place where we can always be safe, is to follow the law, which is the only thing that can unite us in our different interpretations of humanity. So the second thing I want to speak of is constitutionality. The United States Constitution guarantees a woman right of choice and the United States Constitution. And it seems to me while that happens, men and women ought to respect that constitutional right. And I don't think it should be any lesser constitutional right than some of the others we have. Let me note the right to bear arms. It seems to me that a woman ought to have at least as much constitutional right that is now respected by the U.S. Supreme Court to her own body as a man does to his firearm. And if we would think of these constitutional rights with equal dignity, perhaps we would allow individuals to make those individual choices. And this essentially would deny people the right to make their individual choices with their bodies.
and men who enjoy their right to bear arms, which is a constitutional right and is adequately in it and should be respected, ought to respect a woman's right to protect her constitutional right of choice. And I think out of humility of recognizing the supremacy of law and the appropriateness of respecting a woman's individual dignity, this amendment, although I know sincere, should not be adopted by this committee. I yield to the gentlelady from Illinois. I thank the gentlelady for, for yielding. I want to respect the views of all of my colleagues here. All of us have our various beliefs that, that may come out of our religious beliefs, our own set of moral values. And I, I just don't want to leave unrepresented the views of millions and millions and millions of people, not just women, but men across this country, that believe that comprehensive health care does include reproductive health care, prenatal and maternity care, screening for breast cervical and other cancers or STDs, abortion, contraceptive services, that these are all basic health care for women that we have a right to by virtue of our reproductive organs and our right to control our own bodies. And I, I, I just, I just want to say that polling was done, and I know this is an issue that p people don't want to talk about polling, and I understand that. But it, it should, you should just know that voters overwhelmingly support the broad outlines of reform and requiring coverage of women's reproductive health. Seventy percent favor such a proposal. But if the reform eliminated current insurance coverage of reproductive health services like birth control or abortion, the word was used in the poll, opposition to health care reform jumps to three in five, 60 percent, with 47 percent strongly opposing it and just 31 percent favoring it. This is mainstream to allow women to choose their own control of their own bodies, including abortion services. The gentlelady's time has expired and the chair neglected to notice, so we'll give the other side an additional minute. Mr. Barton. Except I don't think my microphone's working. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the only thing I want to respond to is something that Mr. Inslee said. If you look at the Second Amendment, it says the, uh, the necessity of maintaining a well-regulated militia, the right to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed upon. It's explicit in the Second Amendment to the Constitution, uh, second only to uh, freedom of speech. The uh, Roe versus Wade decision was a five to four Supreme Court decision, which those voting with the majority by one vote spoke of somewhere in the penumbras of the Constitution. You can't read the Constitution of the United States and anywhere in it even find the word abortion or choice. So there is a Supreme Court decision that is the law of the land, but that is not an explicit guarantee like the right to keep and bear arms. With well, that, I yield you. to Mr. Shimkus. Uh, thank you. I, uh, to the Ranking Member Barton. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, these, this security of life granted in the Declaration of Independence Amen. is for the unborn. And for those to attack that, that's what this debate is about. And this is a great time to go on record that if you support the right to life, here's, here's the chance. And if you support the Declaration of Independence that granted these inalienable rights, this is the time. Well, gentlemen, Yield back. Yeah, please. Yield to the gentleman. Thank you. I just want to respond to a couple of the, uh, the points that were made. First of all, the Caps Amendment has a loophole. If Hyde goes away, abortion coverage will be mandated in the public plan. Secondly, nothing in this amendment says anything about disallowing voluntarily offered abortion coverage. It simply says 
that the government can't mandate abortion coverage. If private plans want to cover abortion, this amendment doesn't stop that. What it stops is the mandate to force abortion in every insurance plan in the country. The question whether the secretary or the advisory committee or commissioner can mandate that plans covers abortion. And if that is not the intent, this amendment should pass unanimously. And finally, on this poll, I have a copy of that poll. It was extraordinarily skewed in favor of the pro-abortion view. Poll participants were left with the impression that the pro-life position would result in lack of access to contraception, no miscarriage treatment, failure to, to even provide abortion to save a woman's life. Completely unrealistic representation of the pro-life position. There are other polls that have been taken as well. I urge support for the amendment. Uh, Mr. Yep. Chairman, seeing no other members. So the gentleman yield. Uh, Mr. Mr. Terry, okay, I didn't see you, Mr. Terry. Thank you. I, who, somebody else was asking to yield too, uh, Mr. Gingrey, okay. but I was waving my hand. But. I just thought it was interesting that we keep hearing about uh, the, the CAPS amendment as this compromise amendment. They must have been compromising amongst the pro-abortion because really the only thing that's changed in here is that uh, the CAPS amendment am uh, mandates that at least one uh, private plan under the publicly supported National Insurance Exchange has to have abortion services as part of it. But then I guess as the compromise amongst themselves said, okay, in balance, let have one not have abortion services. That isn't a compromise, folks, with true pro-life people in the room. Uh, I just want to clear that up. Uh, I don't think there was anyone that belongs to the pro-life caucus that would have been uh, at that discussion, and I yield back. Dr. Gingrey. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I, I, in, re, in reference to the, the CAPS amendment, the so-called uh, compromise the, amendment, yeah. uh, I just want to point out that the 28 of us on this side uh, and uh, Mr. Stupak uh, that voted against the compromise, we, we are saying that we don't compromise. We don't compromise on our opposition to the use of taxpayer dollars to pay for the destruction uh, of human life unless it's to protect the life of the mother or in the case of forcible rape or incest. Nothing could be clearer. Uh, I commend the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak, gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Blunt, uh, and I commend all of those who are unwilling to compromise, uh, and I highly recommend that we pass this amendment. And I yield back my time to the gentleman from Pennsylvania. It's actually the gentleman from Texas. And Mr. Chairman, before I yield back, I do want to correct one thing. Dr. King, you said there were actually six Democrats who voted the 22 Republicans uh, for life. So I want to let all six on the majority side know we appreciate that. And with that, I would uh, see a no more folks seeking recognition. Yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Ask for a uh, I vote on the well. Gentleman yields back his time. Uh, after further recognition, Ms. Eshoo, for the last five minutes of debate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really didn't plan to um, uh, to speak on this, but simply cast my vote. Um, but I do want to say a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, passions are high, and I understand that, and I respect it, and I respect it. Um, I think what Mr. Inslee said has had the most impact on me, though. We are a nation of laws, and it seems to me that there is a law that, um, that is on the books that, uh, that I would acknowledge has not been embraced 100 percent by the American people. There are great tensions uh, within uh, that law and what it represents. Uh, from the faith side, I consider myself um, extremely devout, a devout Catholic. Um, some can't understand my faith and some of my votes, but I'm at peace with myself with that. What I am especially struck with are the number of voices that leave out what women go through. 
and how complex women's bodies are, and the variety of services that are so necessary to address what conditions they may suffer from. I don't hear people raising their voices about any of that. I think every time an abortion takes place in this country, it means we have failed somehow. But I don't see a word in this amendment or in any other that says that any of these plans should allow for birth control. Why not that? Why isn't there any passion about that? To prevent unwanted pregnancies. So I, I say these things for the record. I don't think anyone is going to change their minds about where they are. And what I say is not meant to change anyone's mind. I'm not that naive. Would, would uh, but I do think that it's seconds? important to, uh, to say them. Uh, was someone asking for me to yield? Uh, Diana, was it? over on this side. I'll yield. Anna. Uh, in regard to that we're not uh, screaming, you're right. But there are many of us that feel or understand that some, the ro reproductive rights or birth control, those type of things, uh, are probably going to be in these plans, or at least to some extent, uh, we're drawing the line on here at abortion, and yeah, that's well, why I'm, that's I'm the just, argument. I want to reclaim my time. Back. Uh, I appreciate what the gentleman said, uh, but uh, um, I don't think you'd ever be convinced uh, to do an amendment to the amendment uh, to include uh, uh, birth control. So uh, uh, I think Ms. Capps would like, uh, I'd be glad to yield to her. Thank you. And I thank my colleague for yielding, and I want to associate myself with your remarks and also uh, the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Inslee. Um, this is a, a very specific uh, targeted question that I want to ask counsel because uh, on the last line um, of the amendment by Mr. Pitts and Mr. Stupak, the, uh, uh, the limitation is t it includes simply forcible rape or incest. And I want to ask counsel, uh, the Hyde Amendment, um, uh, or uh, what language is there about rape? I believe that the current Hyde Amendment, I did not look at yesterday's vote, but the Hyde Amendment, as it's been for the last at least 10 years, has been all rape, not limited. Statutory as well as forcible. So statutory rape as well as forcible rape. And perhaps I should ask uh, it, it, about the, the restriction just to, to forcible is rape. Is there such thing if as permissive rape? Statutory. I beg your pardon? I beg your pardon. If the uh, if that was a deliberate if if the uh, lady wishes uh, Still the time. word forcible to be stricken and would accept the amendment, I would agree to that. This is uh, uh, can I was only a question of counsel and then to ask that. I'm reclaiming my time. Please. I'm reclaiming my time, and I I think that what I'd like to do is just yield back at this point because I think people will hold their views. I respect that, um, but I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, especially you're giving me the time uh, to be able to say the things that I did today. Thank you, and to thank the others as well. Mr. Chairman. Generally yields back your time. Could I ask you to ask consent to remove the word forcible from the amendment? Any objection? I object. Objection is heard. We'll now proceed to a vote on the Pitt amendment. Pitt's amendment. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Markey. No. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, no. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. No. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak. Yes. Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Engel. No. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green. No. Mr. Green, no. Ms. Zaget. No. Ms. Zaget, no. No. Mrs. Capps. No. Mrs. Capps, no. Mr. Doyle. No. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. No. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Schakowsky. No. Ms. Schakowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez. No. 
Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee, Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin, no. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross, Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson, yes. Mr. Matheson, I. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson, Mr. Barrow, yes. Mr. Barrow, I. Mr. Hill, Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen, Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor, Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes, Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut, Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space, Mr. McNerney, Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton, Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley, Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch, Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mac, aye. Ms. Bono Mac, aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania, aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Boucher, Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Gordon, aye. Mr. Gordon, aye. Mr. 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 Ross. No. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Hill. Aye. Mr. Hill votes aye. Um, Mr. Ross. Um, Ross is aye. No, no to aye. Ross is off no and on aye. Mr. Melanson? Aye. Mr. Melanson, aye. <laughs> Have all members responded to the vote? Any member wish to change his or her vote? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman? I wish to uh, change my vote from no to aye. Mr. Waxman is off no and on aye. All members have responded. Any other member wish to seek or to change his or her vote? Anybody want to parachute in that hasn't voted? If not, the clerk will tally the vote. 
Could we have the vote reported, please? Clerk will report the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the ayes were 31 and the nays were 27. 31 ayes, 27 noes. The uh, amendment is agreed to. Mr. Markey, Mr. for what Chairman, purpose have, do you seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. It is uh, Markey number three. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Mr. Markey of Massachusetts and Mr. Burgess of Texas. Without objection, the reading of the amendment will be dispensed of, dispensed with, and gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And I am pleased to offer this important bipartisan amendment with Dr. Burgess. Our amendment is based upon legislation that I first introduced with Chris Smith last year, the Independence at Home Act. Our amendment is supported by a wide range of stakeholders, including the AARP, Consumers Union, Wyeth, the American Academy of Home Care Physicians, Intel, and 30 other organizations. Our amendment creates the Independence at Home pilot program in the 13 states with the highest Medicare per patient costs plus 13 additional states to be identified by the Secretary to ensure geographical rep representation and the District of Columbia for a total of 26 states and the District of Columbia. Would, would the gentleman yield? I'll be glad to yield. We are prepared to accept the amendment. You might want to let Mr. Burgess speak briefly, but we, we think it's a good amendment. I thank the gentleman. I'll, I'll yield to the gentleman from Texas. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and uh, I just so appreciate his offering this amendment. This is one of the most important issues that our generation will face and hand off to the next generation. So I applaud the, the gentleman for bringing the amendment forward. I think it is, it is one, of those, uh, one of those areas where we're apt to achieve some significant savings and significant breakthroughs, and I'll yield back my gentleman time. yield to me. I, I'd be glad to yield to the gentleman. Uh, this uh, amendment creates the Independence at Home pilot program, and I'm pleased it's a bipartisan effort by you and Mr. Burgess. The pilot's another innovative delivery system reform. It addresses a particular version of the medical home, which has shown great promise, especially for people with cognitive impairments and people who are homebound. I appreciate the work that has been done to uh, produce this language uh, and worked out with CMS and our staffs. Uh, this is a common sense provision that will help to further bend the cost curve and I urge members to support it. If I may reclaim my time. My mother died from Alzheimer's, and, and I learned a big lesson during that whole process that I think is something that we're all going to learn as well, because 12 to 15 million baby boomers are going to have Alzheimer's, uh, which means, in most instances, that one other family member will have it with them. That is, the family member that's trying to take care of them. So that's uh, 24 to 30 million Americans in the baby boomer category who are going to have to deal with that issue. Uh, in addition to uh, Parkinson's, ALS, all the chronic diseases. Uh, and uh, that's why we definitely have to increase the funding for NIH research uh, to try to cure these diseases, that's for sure. Uh, but this program will authorize a, a program uh, that will provide coordinated care to Medicare beneficiaries with multiple chronic conditions in their own homes by interdisciplinary teams of healthcare professionals such as physicians, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, physician assistants, social workers, and others. The project will run for three years. It can be extended if the, um, if the uh, secretary determines it should be. But it will deal principally with those Medicare beneficiaries with monic mo multiple chronic diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, other diseases. Uh, 10 percent of the Medicare population, that's all it represents, but 60 percent of Medicare spending. Okay. So if we can interject a program like this uh, with the goal of saving money while keeping people at home, which ultimately is the objective that Dr. Burgess and I 
half of the program, uh, then I think we are, being, uh, we are beginning to put in place the kinds of programs that we are going to need for our medical system uh, if we are going to deal with this tsunami uh, of health care uh, issues that are going to hit the baby boomer generation. I thank everyone for their support, uh, and I yield back the balance of my time. We will now proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the Markey uh, Burgess Amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendments agreed to. Mr. Burgess, do you have an amendment at the desk? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. This is Burgess number 28. Thank you. The clerk will report the uh, amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Burgess of Texas. Strike subtitle B of Title II of Division A and conform table of contents accord appropriately. In section Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman for yielding. Mr. Chairman, a recent article in the Dallas Morning News back home highlighted the troubles that a young girl had who was covered by Medicaid. She had difficulty finding a doctor to treat her, stating that due to the lack of Medicaid doctors, Medicaid patients often grow sicker while they're hunting for a doctor. There are, of course, similar stories out there every day outlining the difficulties that patients with government health care face on a day-by-day -day basis. This is not rhetoric. This is reality. And it will be reality for millions more Americans who inevitably will be pushed onto the roles of government-run health care if the public plan is part of the health care reform bill. A government plan would not compete fairly with private plans. It's like the umpire being on the home team, and it does not work. So the amendment is fairly simple. It strikes all language pertaining to a public plan and specifies in the bill that no federal funds may be used to invest in, establish, or operate a government-run health care plan. Now, Mr. Chairman, I am committed to helping the millions of Americans who want coverage and to lowering costs for everyone. I will not, however, allow that coverage to come in the form of a slow but inevitable takeover of our nation's health care system. And that's exactly, precisely what the creation of a public option, which is probably more appropriately referred to as government insurance, will do. Let me be clear. I am not, I was not, I have not, nor will I ever be an advocate on behalf of private health insurance companies. But I do believe the role of the government is to play that role of referee or umpire, ensuring performance standards are met and that everyone is treated fairly, but then it should get out of the way and let American hard work and ingenuity and American know-how do what it does best. That's why I think it's so important for this amendment to pass. We do not need more government involvement in health care, and we do not need a government-run health care option. Now, I know it's often quoted that the American Medical Association is in favor of H.R. 3200, which includes the language for a public option. Let me just say, from the perspective of my physician colleagues in Texas, this is not a popular notion. So I would encourage members to think of their physicians back home, think of their patients back home. Let's do the right thing by creating the right kind of system and reject the public option. I'll be happy to yield to my friend from Michigan. Thank you, Doctor. From Michigan, and Henry Ford was a great industrialist there, and he said, you can have any color car you want as long as it's black. And that's all he sold was black cars. This is exactly where you're going with this notion on a government-run plan. And, you know, I thought that the tirade from my friend from New York was entertaining. But the more I listened to him, the more I really understood that that is the philosophy where we're going, that private plans are inherently bad and can't work for America, and we should shove everybody onto a government plan. Matter of fact, the Lewin study, over 100 million Americans will lose the health care as they know it today. 100 million. Matter of fact, they said, and we're willing to use the weight of government to do great things to Medicare. Cut it. $400 billion cut out of Medicare. Hospice, home nursing, hospitals, $400 hundred billion dollars. Why? Because that's the only way the government can control costs, by denying access or rationing care. That's it. Look at Canada. Look at the United Kingdom. 
in systems that have it, that's the only way they can control costs. And you're going to take all of these 100 million people, put them onto a government plan that tells doctors, we will not pay you what it costs to see that patient. If you don't think that is trouble a brewing, look at the health systems in the European system. They are dying under the weight of their system. And matter of fact, the fastest growing part of their system are people who are escaping it and getting their own private health care insurance. Americans deserve better. People like the states of Michigan who built the middle class, who built this notion that you could work really hard and, oh, by the way, you get great health care as part of your employment, is destroyed by this system. If you're a cancer survivor, look out. If you're somebody who has a serious ailment that takes very complicated treatment, look out. Because you're going to have to call up to a bureaucrat and hope to God that his calculator is more compassionate and smarter than your doctor. And I would yield back my time. Well, reclaiming my time, and I thank the gentleman's passion on this issue. This committee, our subcommittee on health, heard in this very room testimony from a pediatrician from Alabama whose Medicaid patient population had grown to 70 percent of her practice. She was borrowing from her retirement fund to keep her doors open. Gentleman's time has expired. Can I, can I ask unanimous consent for an additional 15 seconds? Without objection, gentleman is recognized for additional 15 if seconds. She, if we take away the cross-subsidization of the private sector, the public sector cannot afford what, uh, what it's going to be required to pay. And doctors across the country are going to inevitably be borrowing for operational expenses. And as a business model, for those of you in the room who have run your own business, you know that is not a mo model for survival. I urge uh, a, an affirmative vote for this amendment, and I will yield back the additional time. And I thank the chairman for his indulgence. Who seeks recognition? Gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Murphy. I thank the chairman. Listen, I understand that the public plan has kind of become the boogeyman in a lot of this conversation. Um, I think it's a lot harder to present the argument if you're really reading how this is laid out in the bill. There's nothing to be scared of here because this ultimately gets at the issue that a lot of Republicans have run on and talked about on the House floor, and that's choice. That's choice for our, for our, for, for our constituents, for our patients. Um, the fact is, is that there's no one that's going to be forced into the public option. It's going to be every individual's choice as to whether they want to stay in private insurance or they want to choose public insurance. If you guys are right and the government can't run an efficient product, can't put something competitive on the market, then it's going to lose out. This bill requires that the public option finance itself completely with its own premiums. So if it can't do a good job of running its own show, then no one's going to buy into it. Second, it's not going to eliminate private insurance. We have a CBO estimate that shows us very clearly that not only are there only by their estimate going to be about 10 million people that take the public option, which by my count is about 3 percent of total patients across the country, but we're actually going to see more people as a result of this bill, not less, go to private insurance. So contrary to the arguments that we've heard, uh, though there are going to be about 3% of people in the public option, actually more people are going to be in private insurance, not less. Um, and lastly, this mythology that's out there that people have a choice today just isn't rooted in fact. 50% of the states in this country have one insurer that control more than 50% of the market. In some areas, especially rural areas in this country, there's one insurer that controls 70 percent of the market. That's no choice for individuals who are trying to go out there and find a more affordable product. This bill, with the public option, gives people that choice. And it's not just their choice, it's doctor's choice as well. No physician is going to be forced into this. It's going to be their choice as to whether the rates that the public plan pays is enough to bring them in. Uh, so uh, I, I think that this is essential to trying to inject competitiveness into the health care market by giving our constituents, patients in the system, the choice that they have been longing for for a very long time. Would the gentleman yield? Or? I'd be happy to yield to Ms. Baldwin. Um, I, I want to underscore a couple of things you said and expand on, on your point. A robust public option is absolutely essential to the success of, of what we are trying to do here. And you've just heard the gentleman talk about the places with few choices to begin with. And so a public choice will make meaningful the idea of choice. I also just have to name the obvious. 
our, our private options are for profit. The public option will not have that motivating force. If you look at the CEO salaries of the top seven private insurers, this is on average 9.7 million. And that is an average, some are much higher. That's enough to cover 648 families with health insurance for a year. That's what that is. The CEO of the public plan is going to earn a high government salary, under $200,000, likely maybe somewhere around $150,000. The last point I want to make, and I realize I've made this point many times before in this committee, what? is to draw your attention to the Wisconsin example in Medicare Part D. Medicare Part D is an exchange. In all your states, all people have is private options. We happen to be very fortunate in Wisconsin is that we have a public option. It's called senior care. And it exists by waiver of the Department of Health and Human Services. This is a very successful program, very popular among seniors. The cost per enrollee is one third the cost of the private plans that are competing. But for all of those of you who are out there saying that inserting a public option will stifle private competition, we have more private sector choices in Medicare Part D in Wisconsin than most other states. This has been a singular success to have a public option competing side by side the private options. And I will tell you that to a one, every member of our congressional delegation, Democrat and Republican, when that waiver was up, wrote the secretary saying, please, please, please give us our waiver to continue our public option. And when Jim Sensenbrenner and I can agree on something, you know you got to have a good thing. So we've got to keep a public option. I, I, I think the gentlelady, listen, I just want our constituents to have this choice. I want our constituents to be able to decide whether they want to stick with their private plan or they want something kind of like what we have as members of Congress, kind of like what people get in Medicare. I think that that's okay to allow for our constituents to have that choice. I don't think they're so dumb as to not be able to figure out what's best for them. Uh, and that's why I support the gentleman's argument. time has expired. Are we ready for the vote? Mr. Chairman, who seeks recognition? I move to strike the last word. Well, a uh, gentleman will be recognized uh, for five minutes, for the last five minutes of debate on uh, the Republican side. And I, I hope you won't take it. Maybe we can uh, go to the vote earlier. Gentleman's recognized. Well, I make no promises not to take it because I think this is very, very important. Uh, there is indeed a heated debate in this nation as to whether or not the offering of a public plan will destroy private insurance. Indeed, there isn't any debate in the minds of some members of Congress. Some members of Congress have said flat out that the goal behind a public option is a single-payer care. Indeed, uh, Barney Frank said that in a recorded statement that's now being published uh, all over the Internet right now. He said the way we get to a single-payer system is to start with a public option. Let's talk about choice. Republicans desperately want choice. We believe in choice. But what's stopping choice in America today is not the absence of a public option. What's stopping choice in America today is the tax code says that if your employer buys your health care, he pays with before tax dollars. But if you buy your health care, you have to pay with after tax dollars. That makes it impossible for the average American to go buy health care on their own. So they have to take health care that's controlled by a third party. If you want to give choice to the American people, then let every single American buy their health care with pre-tax dollars. If they like their employer's plan, fine, take that plan. But if they don't, let them buy it with their own money. And Republicans would give them a tax credit to do it and give them a refundable and advanceable tax credit to do it. Now, Democrats say that a public option will set a level playing field. It can't set a level playing field. Indeed, there will be no property tax imposed on a federal government health care plan. It will public option. There will be no financial solvency requirements. We were just told there will be no high salary. So we are favoring the public plan, and the public plan will drive out of existence the private plans. It's just a matter of time. Mr. Frank is very blunt about saying that. There are members of this committee that have said that. Talk a little bit about what's the notion behind a robust public option. Well, do we need a robust public option for auto insurance? No, we don't, because we let people buy their own auto insurance on the same basis as businesses. Do we have a public option? Are you proposing a public option for life insurance? 
Are you proposing a public option for food? Why shouldn't we be able to go to a public food vendor and get private competition and profit out of the food sales business? The reality is that a public option is not needed to promote competition. What's needed to promote competition and bring down the cost of health care in America is to empower individual Americans and let them buy their own care. Take their employer's care in if they choose or go buy their own care with money that we give to them if they can't otherwise afford care. That's real choice. That's the choice that Republicans have been talking about, not some put up government plan. And as for the choice that is given in Medicare Part B, I believe you're repealing that in this very bill. So I don't know how, if that's the great model, you can also seek to repeal it in this bill. There will be no fair competition by the private sector if you have a public choice option. We will subsidize it like we currently subsidize other public health care. And I'd be happy to yield to the lady from Tennessee. I thank the gentleman from Arizona for yielding. And I find it so interesting as we have this debate what we have seen in Tennessee is what actually happens when you have a government plan, a government-run plan, in competition with private insurance. Our plan was put in place in 94. It was the test case for Hillary Clinton's health care plan. It was the public option plan that you can look at now with 15 years of data behind it and say it did not work. And look at what happened. When it comes to choice and individual choice, it limited and restricted that choice. People were forced out of their private insurance plans, and they were forced onto a government plan. And then to get costs back under control, guess what the governor had to do a couple of years ago? Remove nearly 200,000 of them. Guess what's getting ready to happen now? There are more people, over 100,000 people, that are going to be removed. Lack of competitiveness is what you see. You do not see more competitiveness. It is a plan that does not work. It has been described in our state as a disaster. The plan quadrupled in cost and consumed 36% of the state budget, and it ended up restricting access and driving costs through the roof. And I yield back to the gentleman from Arizona. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, we have offered the idea of choice on this committee in the past. I proposed legislation that would let you buy insurance in the individual market that was filed and qualified in a separate state and then sold in your state. That would address the problem the gentleman spoke about, which is that there aren't enough plans offering insurance in the states on the individual market. But a public plan won't solve this problem. Gentlemen's time has expired. Do we, uh, do we need more debate or are we ready for a vote? Okay. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. <laughs> Mr. Markey. <laughs> Mr. Batcher. Mr. Pallone? No. Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon? Mr. Rush? Mr. Rush, no. Ms. Eshoo? No. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak? No. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel? No. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green? No. Mr. Green? No. Ms. DeGette? No. Ms. DeGette? No. Mrs. Capps? No. Mrs. Capps? No. Mr. Doyle? No. Mr. Doyle? No. Ms. Harmon? No. Ms. Harmon? No. Ms. Schakowsky? No. Ms. Schakowsky? No. Mr. Gonzalez? No. Mr. Gonzalez? No. Mr. Inslee? No. Mr. Inslee? No. Ms. Baldwin? Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross? Mr. Weiner? No. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson? Mr. Butterfield? No. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Malmazong? Oh, no. Mr. Malmazong, no. Mr. Barron? Most no. 
Chair, no. Mr. Hill. Ms. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. McNerney. No. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Aye. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Aye. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton. Aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Aye. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Aye. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Aye. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Aye. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Aye. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer. Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Benamack, aye. Mr. Walden. <laughs> Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mrs. Myrick. Oh, Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. <laughs> Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Ms. Blackburn. Aye. Ms. Blackburn. Aye. Mr. Gingry. Aye. Mr. Gingry. Aye. Mr. Scullies. Aye. Mr. Scullies. Aye. Mr. Dingle. Dingle. No. Mr. Dingle. No. Mr. Boucher. Aye. Mr. Boucher. Aye. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey. No. Mr. Hill. No. Mr. Hill votes no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, no. Mr. Rogers? Mr. Rogers. Yes. Mr. Rogers votes yes. aye. Any other members uh, wish to record their vote? Clerk will report the tally. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there were 25 ayes and 35 nays. And the amendment is defeated. Okay. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said it wrong. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there were 24 ayes and 35 nays. 24 ayes, 35 nays, and the amendment is defeated. Mr. Stearns, you have a? Mr. Chairman, I have a. We have an amendment goes to the other side. Other side. <laughs> Mr. Stupak? Hi, right, Mr. Chairman, I have amendment desk uh, 005. Clerk will uh, report the amendment. Where's that? Mr. Dupac, did you say, could you repeat the number on the zero zero 005. Five. Top right-hand corner, zero zero 005. Yes, zero zero. I'm so, could you say what division that's to? Is it A or B? A. It's to A. Okay. 
clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Stupak of Michigan, Mr. Mr. Pitts of Pennsylvania, Mr. Terry of Nebraska. At the yes. appropriate place, insert the following section. Yes, that the uh, unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Uh, can I ask again if this is within the um, division and has been um, provided within the time, the two hours? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stupak is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, over the past 35 years, Congress has passed three laws, the Church Amendment, the Coates Amendment, and the hyde Weldon Amendment, protecting the conscious rights for health workers, especially with regard to abortion. However, the landmark piece of legislation we're considering here today does not contain conscious protections for health care workers. We do have on the CAPS Amendment that was accepted on page 6, we do have a reference to it on line 19. Uh, but again, we're, our, our fear is that's going to be a yearly thing. We're going to have to fight it out every year to keep a conscious clause in there. So we're offering this amendment. Conscious is about choice. Healthcare professionals should not be forced to engage in any action that they see as taking a human life. No one should be forced to have an abortion, and no one should be forced to assist in abortion, or nor should any institution be told they must perform abortions in violations of their ethical moral or religious convictions. Healthcare workers, as I said, should not be forced to participate in abortion, euthanasia, or any kind of mercy killing. Some state laws permit physician-assisted suicide and conscious protection provisions will ensure that federal funds cannot be used to force healthcare providers in those states to participate in violation of their conscience. Federal funds directly or through state and local governments or any health care plans created or mandated by Congress should not be used to pressure health care workers to engage in activities they oppose. It should be left up to health care workers as to what does or does not violate their conscience, not to, up to the Congress, not up to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. This is not an abortion issue. No other profession that I can think of is forced by the federal government to engage in practices or procedures they disagree with. The dedicated men and women who choose to enter in the medical prof profession do so to help people. They're highly trained professionals who should have the latitude to determine which treatments to offer their patients. So let's not force our views on anyone. Uh, let's, uh, I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. I would yield to Mr. Terry for comments on this as a co-sponsor of the legislation. Thank you, Mr. Stupak, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to join with you. And since Roe versus Wade was decided in 1973. Congress has always provided steadfast support for those who have had uh, have a conscious, conscientious objection to the practice of abortion, but who, due to the circumstances of their employment in their healthcare field, may be required to assist in abortion procedures. This bill is currently drafted does harm to the well, and with the CAPS amendment does harm to the 36-year precedent of protecting the conscience rights of these doctors, nurses, and other employees uh, employed in allied health professions and denying them the protections that have come to be expected in every other federal foray in the health care. In my district alone, we have two Catholic-run charitable hospitals. Uh, one of them is a teaching hospital. Uh, and. Uh, both have contacted me and basically said that if they are forced to have to uh, subject their doctors and their physicians who work there uh, with the uh, understanding that they won't have to perform abortions or assist in anything that they feel violates their ethic or moral code, and uh, that if they're put in that position, they just may close down the hospital. In fact, that was backed up by uh, uh, further up the chain in the archdiocese. So we're, without this, we're actually going to deny access to hospitals in many communities. And I yield back to Mr. Stupak. Or the gentleman yield. Uh, do you have to Mr. Barton? Uh, the, the majority, I mean, the minority has looked at your amendment and we're prepared to accept it. Uh, Mr. Pitts, did you? Thank you. I got another minute and a half. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this this amendment would prevent discrimination against not only individuals, healthcare professionals, but institutions like Catholic hospitals, uh, 
and insurance companies, uh, health plans who refuse to provide abortions. Uh, health care providers deserve the protections for their legal right to practice without violating their religious beliefs or moral convictions. And on an issue as fundamental as life, health care providers should not be forced to abandon their moral convictions when they come to work. I think this issue strikes to the heart of our nation's founding as a place where individuals could be free to practice their religious faith unhindered. According to an April 8, 2009 poll commissioned by the Christian Medical Association conducted by the polling company, 87 percent of Americans believe it is important to ensure that health care professionals' conscience rights are protected. And as Mr. Stupak said, three laws have been adopted over the years, the Church Amendment, the Coates Amendment, and the Hyde Weldon Amendment. Uh, to protect the conscience right of, of health care workers. This bill um, does nothing uh, satisfactorily to address that, all of those concerns. Uh, under the bill, the Secretary of HHS uh, has numerous authorities to determine what health insurance must cover in plans, but there's no conscience protection to cover to ensure that health care workers or insurers wanting to participate in the exchange are not forced to participate in specific activities they find objectionable. So the need for health protections is very clear. Uh, a lawsuit in 97 against Valley Hospital Association forced this private community hospital in Alaska to open its doors for late-term abortions. The same thing happened in 2002 with a Catholic-operated HMO in New York. Uh, without these protections, our health care providers will be forced to choose between violating their beliefs and leaving their profession or refraining from entering their chosen field together. So I urge uh, the members to protect the right of conscience and support the amendment. Gentleman's time has expired. Um, who has spoken? We've done five and five? Okay. Uh, uh, who would seek recognition? Mr. Green. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to ask the author of the amendment a question if I could ask Congressman Stupak. I know under current procedures oftentimes if someone exercises their conscious uh, decision is there any requirement in your amendment I couldn't find it or anywhere in the law that would say if a, if a woman who may have been raped shows up at a hospital or a clinic is there any way that they could exercise their conscience clause and yet still refer that person to some place that they could receive care is that in your amendment it doesn't state it specifically no but it doesn't I mean we don't state that instance specifically but that that is the chosen I have four Catholic hospitals and, and they said they have had them come there for services and, and they just refer them they, they, well, the we want Texas I would me. feel I would prefer having the language in the amendment I'll be glad to yield to the chairman I, I was just stunned by the language on page two that said that um, nothing in this act shall be construed as forbidding a health plan or health insurance issuer to accommodate the conscien conscientious objection of a purchaser or an individual or institutional health care provider when a procedure is contrary to the religious beliefs or moral convictions of such purchaser or provider. Perhaps we can have an explanation uh, from counsel on that point. Would that mean that a provider could refuse to sell a contraception, contraceptive in a pharmacy? How far would that go? Would that apply to family planning if somebody wanted to get contraceptive services? Uh, maybe, um, Mr. Westmoreland, you can explain what the implications of that uh, section. It, the provision here is not related directly to abortion services. It is any item that or service that a um, health care provider says is contrary to his or her religious beliefs or moral convictions. It is, it is not bounded by abortion as the previous language has been. Mr. Chairman, can I ask Mr. you, Mr. Chairman, up? I couldn't quite hear him. If you could speak into your mic so everyone are here. It's not on. Yes. As I read the language, subsection D, it is not directly related to abortion services. It is about any uh, health care service in this bill to which any provider has a religious or moral objection. 
um, and consequently it could be, if I understood Mr. Waxman's question, it could allow a provider to refrain from providing contraceptive services, which is the question that the chairman posed to me. Well, the gentleman from Texas yield further. I continue to yield. I, I don't think that's necessary. Uh, I wonder if the gentleman from Michigan would consider taking that section. So you're talking about section, subsection D? Yes. Yeah, I'd agree to take it out. Okay. If we, I'd ask unanimous consent to take out section D. Uh, without objection, that'll be the order. Mr. Chairman, reclaiming my time, yes. and again, ask my colleague from Michigan, is I would just feel more comfortable, and I think would, no, I still have my time. I only get one question. <laughs> Uh, I talk, I ask my question slow, Bart. Um, if, if there was something we could do that would place in there what this common practice is in your hospitals, and, and I was born in a Catholic hospital, my children were born in a Catholic hospital, I respect their right to do it, but I also respect their ability to refer someone for they can get services that doesn't have the conscious concern. But is there, is there a, a problem with accepting that in your amendment? No, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm open to it. Uh, we've, uh, we're, we're, well, gentlemen, you well, why don't I withdraw this one for now and let's get these concerns worked out here for a few minutes. Uh, this thing's been around and these things are just coming at us. So let's take a look at it closer. Gentlemen, oh, I guess time. Yeah, withdraw for now and without uh, prejudice and okay. we can return to it. I yield back my time. Uh, Mr. Rush, you wanted to be recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to call uh, two amendments and unblock uh, amendments number 13001 and 14001. Okay. Clerk will report the Rush amendments. It's our turn, I believe, Mr. Chairman. That was a Stupak amendment. Mr. Chairman, do you want me to report the amendments? Or? Report the amendments, please. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3200 offered by Mr. Rush of Illinois. Without and objection, the uh, two amendments will be considered in block, and with, further without objection, they will be considered as read. And the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, is recognized. Five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and fellow members of the, uh, sub of the committee, these amendments mandate better protections for children's early and periodic screening and diagnostic, diagnostic treatment services, EPSDT, uh, easier enrollment processes, and cost-sharing measures. And I would like to enter into a colloquy with uh, you, Mr. Chairman, regarding these amendments. I'm sorry, the gentleman. I would like to uh, enter into a colloquy with yes. you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have major concerns. Just a minute. Will the gentleman suspend? I'd like to ask the committee, please be in order. People want conversations, they can go in the ante rooms. Mr. Rush. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have major concerns with the bill's provisions and protections that release children into the exchange and how they will be treated in relation to children who are currently enrolled in Medicaid and CHIP. It is my concern, as well as the concern of over 65 children's hospital and medical groups, that children will be worse off under this bill than they are currently, uh, than they are, currently are under current public programs, particularly when CHIP expires in 2013. Um, I, I truly understand your concerns, as I think we all would agree that your amendments seek the best approach in protecting the health of children of low-income families. I'm a strong advocate for children's benefits, 
and their continued uh, protection as well. And I want to work with you to ensure that children will not suffer any detriment as a result of this bill. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your belief that this reform effort should reflect the highest pri priority in protecting our nation's most vulnerable children uh, who are poor children. We all extremely regret, regret that if, uh, if we looked up 10 years from now and realized that children were being treated worse under a newly reformed health care system than they are currently under a need of broken uh, health care system. Mr. Chairman, I ask for your commitment uh, to continue to work with me to ensure better protections for children in this bill and to make it easier for poor children be to become enrolled in public benefit programs and to receive the same, if not better, benefits than they currently receive today, particularly EPSDT benefits. And I also uh, ask for your commitment to work to secure better cost-saving protections for families of the children. If these simple ideals are met, we will have not. If these simple ideals are not met, we will have not truly achieved a more affordable health uh, choices uh, benefit program under this particular act. The gentleman will yield uh, to me uh, further. I I am strongly s sympathetic to what you're trying to do. I share those goals and concerns. I uh, will continue to work with you because we've got to do all we can to protect uh, uh, children in this country, especially low-income children, to get all the services that they need. And I will continue to work with you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. I withdraw uh, these amendments. The gentleman withdraws his amendment, amendments and yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stearns, you have an amendment? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. I think it's Stearns 1 or... There's a more arcane name for it. It's ECR9T. The uh, clerk will report to Stearns 1 or some other arcane number to it. Amendment 2, the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3200 offered by Mr. Stearns of Florida. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and the gentleman from Florida is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And my amendment goes to the heart of the debate of protecting consumers with keeping their private policy. Now, Mr. Shattuck of Arizona mentioned uh, the quote from Mr. Barney Frank, the liberal from Massachusetts, who indicated that he hopes we have a one-payer system. Uh, but you know, that's not what the President of the United States has talked about. In fact, the President said, let me quote exactly what the President said. If you like your doctor, you'll be able to keep your doctor under our plan, period. If you like your health care plan, you'll be able to keep your health care plan, period. So the President really doesn't agree with uh, Barney Frank, and I think this amendment goes to the heart of this whole policy position of this bill. Uh, there's most of the people, I think almost all the people on this side of the aisle, thinks, think that it's uh, a proper that individuals should be able to keep their current health pay, uh, plan. In fact, uh, poll numbers show that 83 percent are satisfied with their current health care coverage, and they do not, do not want to be forced into a government-run health care plan. And in their opinion, it could lower quality. It uh, might cost less, but there could be long waiting lines. There could be rationing. And a lack of access to life-saving technologies. So I think when the President says that he wants to protect everybody in America by saying they should be able to keep your health care plan, my amendment simply does that by saying, quote, nothing in this act shall be construed to prevent or limit individuals from keeping their current health coverage. Now that's pretty simple. And this is uh, something that I think majority of people on both sides of the aisle should agree with, except for those diehards that agree with Barney Frank that they want to have a universal government-run program. Obviously, the President doesn't, so my amendment sort of goes along with what the President said. I think the President was being sincere when he said he promised to Americans and their families that they'd be able to keep their health care system. So my amendment is a simple statement that nothing in the act shall be construed to prevent or limit individuals from keeping their current health coverage. Now, when you look at Section 102 of the bill, uh, this language would go in and, and uh, be substituted for that. It's very complex, and I think this would be simple 
if we had my language, because specifically the chairman's bill make it almost impossible for Americans who buy their insurance on the individual market long term to keep that health insurance, even if they like it, by preventing current health plans from changing and adding on to their plan structure, and it forces them to comply with federal mandates that have yet to be determined. So this is a matter of policy, a matter of statement uh, that I think that goes to the heart of this whole debate. Are we going to allow the consumers to keep his or her health care plan? Um, greater competition is um, not necessarily the intent, we've argued on this side of this legislation. And we feel that with this public policy, people will slowly move into it, either through mandates or through pricing or all kinds of different uh, contingencies into this public policy. And we're saying we don't want the government to put stipulations on the commercial private insurance plans that would force Americans to move into the public policy. Uh, so by creating a federal regulated health care system, government run, uh, competing with the private health insurance, it won't be long, if we're not careful, that everybody will be moving into the public policy. But it's if we put ourselves in the position that nothing in this health care plan would commit Americans uh, to move into the public policy by mandates, by uh, the uh, pricing uh, of this public policy, I think we're making a statement which is in agreement with the President has indicated. We're actually saying, positioning the government as the umpire pitcher in the health care game, the government is setting the rules, calls the balls and strikes, controls what kind of delivery is offered, so they have a lopsided advantage, uh, and so we don't produce a level playing field. So my simple amendment is following up with what the President promised, what 83 percent of American families have said when they say, I want to keep the coverage that I have. And it fulfills basically the promise that Americans will be able to keep their health care plan, period. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I just don't understand why this amendment is necessary because it, it says nothing in this bill will prevent or limit individuals from keeping their current health benefits plan. I mean, the fact of the matter is that the bill already permits an indefinite grandfather provision for individual health insurance policies. So that means that if you like your individual policy, you can keep it as long as you like and as long as it continues to be offered. Now, that doesn't mean that it's likely you're going to do that because, frankly, that means it may very well be that it doesn't have essential be minimum benefits that we're going to provide. It may not have certain protections. So I think it's not likely that many people will continue with those individual policies if they can get a better option in the health exchange. But they're definitely allowed to keep it indefinitely uh, under this bill. Now, with regard to existing employment-based group health plans, uh, they're allowed to stay the same uh, for a five-year period. The reason for that is that, and the reason for the shorter grandfather period for job-based plans is because the choice of plans an employer makes affects all workers, not just uh, the employer. And the fact of the matter is that after five years, we want to make sure that the essential benefit package and all the other consumer protections that exist under this legislation, no discrimination for pre existing conditions, for example, and other protections, kick in. Uh, because otherwise, an employer could decide, well, I don't want to provide those basic benefits. I don't want to provide uh, the, uh, uh, you know, I want to continue with discriminatory policies indefinitely, even though the employee uh, decides he doesn't want to do that. I don't think that's fair. Uh, so there is a distinction, if you will, between individual policies and employer policies for that reasons. Bottom line is people should be able to have a choice if they want uh, a better package and if they want these consumer protections. If they don't want them as an individual, they don't have to do it. They can keep what they have. But I don't think that people who are, have employer-sponsored plan should be forced into that situation if they can find uh, it, it, they should be able to take advantage of the better protections and the better benefit package that's being offered. I'd like uh, to yield to the gentlewoman from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Plum, for yielding the time. Members, you need to be very careful with this amendment because what it does, it sounds very simple. It's a two 
two-line amendment, but what it does is it cuts out three or four very important pages of this bill that introduce for the first time very important consumer protections that American families have been clamoring for for many years. For the first time, Americans will not be discriminated against due to pre-existing conditions. Insurance companies will be prohibited from refusing you coverage because of your medical history. For the first time, no exorbitant out-of-pocket expenses, deductibles, or co-pays. Insurance companies will have to abide by yearly caps on how much they can charge for out-of-pocket expenses. No cost sharing for preventative care. Insurance companies must fully cover without charge regular checkups and tests that help you prevent illness such as mammograms or eye and foot exams for diabetics. They can't drop coverage if you're seriously ill. Insurance companies will be prohibited from dropping or watering down insurance coverage for those who become seriously ill. No gender-based discrimination, no annual or lifetime caps, extended coverage for young adults, Children would continue to be eligible for family coverage through the age of 26. This amendment says health care in America is working. You like the status quo. We need to vote it down because what is happening Easy. today is not acceptable for American families. This amendment continues to allow today's broken insurance market to thrive, discriminating against the elderly and sick. Instead, our health reform bill creates a new health insurance market where people are no longer discriminated against because of their health status, their pre-existing conditions, their gender, where they work, and a whole host of other reasons. So uh, vote down this amendment and instead let's fix this broken health insurance marketplace where everyone, whether they're old or young or sick or healthy men or women, can access <laughs> quality health care. Mr. Chairman, could it, I would yield briefly. the remaining time to Mr. Green. This is such a simple amendment, and I'm concerned, I guess, because this division shall not permit or limit individuals from keeping their current health benefit plan. If you have a private health care plan from your company, ABC, and ABC decides to reduce the benefits, I wonder how this very short amendment would impact that, and I know I've run out of time. Thank you. That's the problem. Mr. Chairman? Who seeks recognition? Mr. Barton. And I'll, I'll yield to Mr. Shaddy. I just want to read. Um, in Section 102 of the pending bill, um, what makes this amendment necessary? It's on page 16, the bottom line uh, 20. Uh, it says grace period for current employer employment-based health plans. In general, the commissioner shall establish a grace period whereby for plan years beginning after the end of the five-year period, beginning with year one, an employment-based health plan in operation as of the day before the first day of year one must meet the same requirements as apply to a qualified health benefits plan under Section 101, including the essential benefit package requirement under Section 121. So if you like what you have and you want to keep it, the best that can be said under this bill is that you might get to keep it for five years. Will the gentleman yield? Be happy to but Mr. You see, this is exactly my point, uh, uh, Mr. Barton, that if you're an individual and you decide you don't want the basic benefit package, you're willing to do with less, then that's fine. But an employer who decides beyond this grace period that he's going to continue to offer less, than, less benefits than, uh, than the standard package, what? Well, the gentleman he, he shouldn't be allowed to do that to his employee. The employee should be I able to, to have the benefit. I need to my time because what this grace period does is give you five years and then your current plan, if you like it, if it doesn't meet all these other requirements. But the individual Mr. doesn't no. have that option. Yield to Mr. Shaddy. Thank Mr. you. I thank, the time. I thank the gentleman for yielding. First of all, let's read the language of the amendment. It simply says that nothing shall prevent or limit an individual from keeping. That means it is their choice to keep it. But the language of the bill, Mr. Plone, does not do what you say. If you go to Section 102, page 15, and you read it, it says that health insurance is uh, grandfathered. It's talking there about individual health insurance. But if you read down to line 20, it says it's grandfathered if but only if the following conditions are met. And then you read lines 20 through 25, and those say uh, 
it's grandfathered, that individual policy is grandfathered if they don't sell any more coverage to anybody else. Any plan that's out there in existence that you can never enroll anybody new in will go away. It, it, you can't sustain a policy if you can't enroll new people. But second, you go to page 16 and you look at lines 7 through 12 and it says you can make no changes in the plan. So if you have a plan right now under the language of this bill and the person offering that plan decides to give you more benefits, they decide, you know what, we have not covered uh, breast implants in the past or we have not covered this or that or the other item, as soon as they make a change in the plan, they've disqualified and you can no longer keep that plan. On top of which, Mr. Barton is quite correct. If you read further on uh, to the lines 20 through 25 of that page and picking up on line 17, every single employer-based plan in the nation has to go away in five years because it has to meet all of these requirements, including the minimum provided benefits. And the minimum provided benefits haven't even been prescribed in the law yet. The reality is when the president says that if you like you plan, you can keep it, the very specific language of the bill says that no plan, individual or group, will be able to be in existence five years from now. Some of them will go away immediately, others will go away in five years, but no one, literally no one, will be able to keep their plan beyond five years, and I'd be happy to yield to the gentlelady from Tennessee. Well, it's actually my time, and I'll be happy to yield to the gentlelady from Tennessee for about 30 seconds, and then Mr. Burton I, for about 30. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I agree with everything that has been said, and I do support the amendment. A couple of points. Our 10 care experience, when you have no cost yeah, sharing, guess what happens? You encourage overuse. We saw this to the point that we ended up with the highest scripts rate in the country. The next thing, extended coverage to children 26 and under. I really have questions about uh, the wisdom of putting that as the upper age limit as uh, what is considered a child. And I yield to Mr. Barton for the purpose Go of yielding to Dr. Burgess, to Mr. Burgess very quickly, 17. Yep. And, uh, Thank you for yielding. I would just remind the chairman that when we had our legislative hearing in this room, I asked Secretary Sebelius if I would be able to keep my high deductible health savings account or if it would be deemed non-qualified and I would be penalized if I wanted to keep it. You, Mr. Chairman, addressed the secretary and said that the gentleman had an important, raised an important point and deserved an answer. And I'll, I'll just tell you, to, this, to date, I have not received an answer from the secretary. And I uh, yield back to his Time has expired. Who seeks recognition? The chair recognizes himself in opposition to this amendment. Uh, today's individual health insurance market is completely dysfunctional. Even America's health insurance plans have recognized that insurance market reforms are necessary. This amendment continues to allow today's broken insurance market to thrive, discriminating against the elderly and the sick. The bill creates a new health insurance market where people are no longer allowed to be discriminated against, and the bill would grandfather people in their current plans, preserving the promise that people can keep the coverage they have if they like it. But new plans will need to follow the new insurance requirements. People can still enroll in new individual market plans, just ones that do not discriminate. Allowing an individual market that does not meet the new reforms means insurers will continue to play games to get the healthiest individuals leaving the sickest in the reformed market. It's time to fix the broken marketplace where everyone, old, young, sick, healthy, men and women, can access quality health care. And I urge members to vote against the, uh, uh, the Stearns Amendment. Any else, anyone else seems recognition? If not, we'll proceed to the vote. You want a roll call? Roll call. Sure. We'll proceed to a roll call vote. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingle. No. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no.
Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes no. Mr. Stupak. No. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. No. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green. No. Mr. Green, no. Ms. Deget. No. Ms. Deget, no. Mrs. Katz. No. Mrs. Katz votes no. Mr. Doyle. No. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. No. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Schakowsky. <coughs> Mr. Gonzalez. No. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee. No. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. No. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner votes no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson, aye. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow, aye. Mr. Hill. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Space. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. No. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Mr. Hall. Aye. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton. Aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Aye. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Aye. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Aye. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Aye. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer. Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Rodanovich. Aye. Mr. Rodanovich, aye. Mr. Pitt. Aye. Mr. Pitt, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Aye. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden. Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Aye. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy, Pennsylvania. Aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Aye. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Space. No. Mr. Space votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Kowski. Mr. Kowski, no. Mr. Markey. No. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut, no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill votes aye. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush wishes to be recognized. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. Rush votes no.
Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Any member wish to change his or her vote? The clerk will tally the vote. The clerk will announce the vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 26 ayes and 32 noes. 26 ayes, 32 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Chairman, if I could just go back to the one amendment we had before in the conscious clause, I think we've got it pretty much just worked one out. one minute before I recognize you. Mr. Chairman, going back to my uh, amendment number Mr. Stupak, we feel withhold for a minute. Mr. Stupak, you're now thank, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, just before we broke it to work this thing out, uh, page 2, line 8 through 14, I asked unanimous consent to strike that subsection D, and I believe that was agreed to. And then after talking with uh, members here, it looks like uh, the amendment would now be acceptable to all sides. Okay. The, uh, first of all, let's call up the Stupak amendment that we put aside a few minutes ago. Uh, clerk will report that Stupak amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Stupak. Of Without objection, it will be considered as read. Gentlemen from Michigan ask unanimous consent to, to strike. Lines 8 through 14 on page 2, subsection D. Any objection? If not, the unanimous consent request is agreed to. If the gentleman would yield to me. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate you making that change. I think this makes the amendment uh, uh, acceptable, and I would urge members to uh, support the amendment. Yield back. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the Stupak amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment's agreed to. Uh, I, Mr. Blunt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Um, it's Blunt, Terry, Gingry. Uh, I'm looking for a number here. ECR 17T. I raise a point of order. Gentlelady from California reserves a point of order on this amendment. The clerk uh, has the clerk been able to identify the amendment? The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 3200 offered by. Mr. Blunt of Missouri, Mr. Terry, Mr. Gingry, and Mrs. Myrick. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman from Missouri is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think Mr. Scalise had also asked to be included in this amendment, and we didn't get that file, but I appreciate his help and Mr. Upton's help on this as well. Uh, this amendment just accepts, in, in my opinion, Mr. Chairman, the reality that uh, the public plan within a very short time uh, becomes the only plan. I don't think the public. I don't think the uh, uh, that the public plan can be a fair competitor. And I think other plans go out of the system. Uh, and this amendment just says that if there is a public plan, that the elected federal officials, the president, the vice president, uh, and members of Congress uh, would enroll would be uh, enrolled in the public plan. Uh, and uh, I, I think that is a leadership thing for us to do. Um, every study you read on this indicates that the other plans would not survive the competition with this public plan. I thought the uh, debate we had earlier actually about uh, Medicare itself further indicated the difficulty of any, any tax-paying competitive plan play, uh, competing for a long period of time. Uh, I probably need to think of a better uh, analogy than this as a Republican, Mr. Chairman, but uh, I sort of see the public competitor, the government competitor, as an elephant in a room full of mice. And believe me, the smart mice get out of the room as quickly as they can. The slower mice get crushed by the elephant, uh, 
And at the end of the day, there's only one competitor left, and that competitor uh, does provide the single payer uh, that uh, the chairman of the finance committee said today he thought the public plan would lead to, that at least one member of this committee has said publicly that she was confident the public plan would lead to, uh, and uh, based on my belief that we would sh sh shortly have only one option anyway, I think that uh, the federally elected officials should uh, uh, be required to go ahead and begin to, to uh, chart the course for what that plan would be like, uh, and I would uh, yield to Mr. Terry. Thank you, Ms. Blunt. I appreciate uh, working with you on this amendment. Uh, first of all, as the, there's lots of questions about the public plan, the government-run plan, uh, what's going to be in it. And frankly, we've been challenged by many constituents to say, you know, if, you're, if there's going to be this government plan, don't you think you should be part of it? And I think in a way that they may have some qualms about uh, how good of a plan this will be, will it eventually be the plan that gets cut back? Uh, and I agree with some of my constituents that say, hey, if we're going to pass this plan, we should put ourselves in it. Secondly, I believe that the people that will eventually end up in this plan because of the scenario set forth by Mr. Blunt that I truly believe is accurate, uh, the people that are in that plan, I think, will feel more secure with members of Congress within this plan perhaps that we would arrest the deterioration of that plan or the rationing that may or likely will occur within there. So I think this is important for us as a committee to step up, uh, prove this uh, language, show that we're going to stand with the people in that public plan. Uh, and uh, at this time, I'll yield back to Mr. Blunt. I'd, I'd yield to Ms. Myrick uh, from North Carolina. Thank you. I um, just simply want to speak in support of the amendment. You know, just it's very simple. It just says members of Congress, Vice President, the President shall participate in this new public plan. And if it is the right choice for all the Americans that, um, you know, a lot of them are going to be losing the coverage that they currently have now. And if this is a good plan for them, then it should be good enough for us as well. And I yield back to Mr. Blunt. Mr. Chairman, I'd uh, yield to Mr. Scalise from Louisiana. I thank the member from Missouri. I appreciate him bringing this amendment forward. And I think it's very important. I strongly oppose this, this government takeover. But for those people who do support this, if you really think this plan is so good, then you should be willing to say that all members of Congress should have to enroll in that plan. Uh, put your money where your mouth is. This is a, a put up or shut up amendment. And I think it's very clear. And I yield back to the gentleman from Missouri. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to yield uh, to Mr. Gingrey of uh, Georgia. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I thank the gentleman for, for yielding, and I'm, I'm proud to be a co-sponsor along with Mr. Blunt, uh, Mr. Terry, Ms. Scalise. Uh, as my colleagues have said, it, you know, what's, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I was on a, a local school board uh, a number of years ago and uh, a public school system. Uh, and it's pr it was pretty much expected that every, every member of that local public school board should have their children in that public school system. They the time has expired. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, if, since I'm a co-sponsor of this amendment, would you uh, ask unanimous consent for an additional minute? Or uh, you can come back to me. We'll, we'll come back. After, yeah, okay. okay. All right. Yield back. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Capps. Mr. Chairman, if I could speak, please, on the point of order that I raised earlier. You wish to assert your point of order? Yes, I do. Uh, Mr. S uh, Mr. Chairman, this amendment invokes a jurisdiction of the Committee on House Administration because it concerns the health benefits of members of Congress. And therefore, the amendment is outside the scope of the referral of this bill. And this bill, and uh, I believe it raises germaneness issues. Gentlelady, assert your point of order. Reserving the right or to speak on the point of order. The gentleman wishes to address the point of order, recognized um, for that purpose. This amendment, and I think identical language, was accepted and put into the bill in the Education and Labor Committee. It was, it was voted on in the Ways and Means Committee, but defeated. It was accepted over in the other body in the Health Committee, which has almost identical jurisdiction on this issue as, as this committee does. Um, 
I'm somewhat puzzled that that it is not germane when we're the committee of primary jurisdiction um, and obviously have jurisdiction over health care uh, in this in this body. So I would hope that we would rule against the point of order. The chairman is ready to uh, rule on the point of order. Uh, it, this amendment goes into the jurisdiction of the House Administration Committee, which uh, has the sole jurisdiction over these matters of setting the, um, well, the, not sole, but has the primary jurisdiction of setting these issues, dealing with these issues. Uh, it, it is not relevant that some other committee did not, uh, might have considered an amendment. A non germane amendment might be considered by a committee if no one raises a point of order. But a point of order has been raised, and the chair sustains the point would the, of would order. The, would the chair yield on that? Yes. If, if I understand your point of order, you're saying even though this committee has jurisdiction, since another committee also does, that it's then not germane. Why would we not be able to, to vote on a, an amendment in this committee since we do have jurisdiction, even if it's shared jurisdiction? The uh, House Administration Committee is not on the referral of the bill, and this amendment raises matters that are in the jurisdiction of the House Administration Committee, and I'm advised that that would make it not germane. A point of Mr. Point of I appeal the ruling of the chair. Yeah, I, point of, point of I would. Information. No, we don't. Well, that's, we don't want to do that. We've had, a, even though we're getting beat most of the time, we've had a pretty good markup. Uh, point if of that's information. That's the point of order. That's the point of order. Mr. Chairman, just a point of information. Yes, Mr. Question. Stearns, point of information. Uh, State your point. You indicated that you're making this decision because the uh, primary jurisdiction for this committee on this question does not have referral. Is that correct? Are you saying that the House Administration does not have referral and that's why you're making your decision? The gentleman is correct. The House Administration does not it uh, has jurisdiction and is not okay. on the referral it, of this is bill. Is it possible then, Mr. Chairman, if we voted on it, then they would get referral so that by voting on it, they would get referral? The gentleman is not correct and the, and the chair must rule uh, with under the rules uh, as he has. And I would just say parenthetically that I would support this amendment if it were appropriately brought Mr. before Mr. us. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have. Mr. Chairman, I do. Mr. Chairman. We're going to move on now. We're going to regular order. Mr. Chairman, I have, I have an appending appeal of the ruling of the chair, and I would like to speak on it to you, Mr. Chairman. I don't think the appeal of the chair is pending or. I move to table the motion, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I move to table the motion. Well, I'm, I'm, let, let's. Let's just vote on the table. There's no motion before us. Move, I move to appeal the ruling of the chair. I move to, I table move the to lay it on the table. The question now comes on laying on the table the appeal of the decision of the chair. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 The ayes have it. Recorded vote, Mr. Chairman. You want a recorded vote? Yep. Well, I guess we'll be here a little later tonight than I hoped. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Markey. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. I'm sorry, Ms. Pallone votes aye. I'm not repeating myself. We have Waxman, Dingle, and Pallone voting aye. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes aye. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Aye. Mr. Green votes aye. Ms. DeGette. Mr. DeGette votes aye. Mrs. Caps. Ms. Caps votes aye. Mr. Doyle. Yes. Mr. Doyle, aye. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon, aye. Ms. Schakowsky. Aye. Ms. Schakowsky, aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Ms. Gonzalez, aye. Mr. Inslee. Aye. Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, aye. 
Mr. Matheson. <laughs> Mr. Butterfield. Aye. Mr. Butterfield. Aye. Mr. Malanson. Aye. Mr. Malanson. Aye. Mr. Barrow. Aye. Mr. Barrow. Aye. Mr. Hill. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui. Aye. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, aye. Ms. Castor, Ms. Castor, aye. Mr. Sarbanes, Mr. Sarbanes, aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut, aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Space, Mr. McNerney, aye. Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton, Ms. Sutton, aye. Mr. Braley, aye. Mr. Braley, aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, aye. Mr. Barton. Present. Mr. Barton, present. Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Hall, no. Mr. Upton. No. Mr. Upton, no. Mr. Stearns. No. Mr. Stearns, no. Mr. Deal. No. Mr. Deal, no. Mr. Whitfield. No. Mr. Whitfield, no. Mr. Shimkus. No. Mr. Shimkus, no. Mr. Shattuck. No. Shattuck. No. Mr. Mr. Blunt. <coughs> Mr. No. Mr. Boyer. No. Mr. Boyer. No. Mr. Radonovich. No. Mr. Radonovich. No. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts. No. Mr. Bono. No. Mr. Bono. No. no. Mr. Walden. No. Mr. Walden. No. Mr. Perry. No. Mr. Terry, no. Mr. Rogers. No. Mr. Rogers, no. Mrs. Meyer. Mrs. Meyer, no. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan. John, John. Say no. Say no. Say no. Mr. Sullivan, no. Mr. Murphy, Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Burgess. No. Burgess, no. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, no. Mr. Gingri. No. Mr. Gingri, no. Mr. Scully. No. Mr. Scully, no. Okay. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Matheson. Aye. Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Engel. Aye. Mr. Engel, aye. Mr. Boucher. Boucher, aye. Mr. Rush. Aye. Mr. Rush, aye. Mr. Gordon. Aye. Mr. Gordon, aye. Mr. Ross. Aye. Mr. Ross, aye. Mr. Markey. Aye. Mr. Markey, aye. Mr. Hill. Aye. Mr. Hill, aye. Mr. Bray. Mr. Space. Aye. Mr. Space, aye. Any other, any mem have all members responded to the call of the roll? Any member wish to change his or her vote? If not, the clerk will tally the vote and report it. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 36 ayes, 22 noes, and one voting present. Th 36 ayes, 22, 22 no noes, one, present. one voting present. Uh, the motion to table carries. The chair now recognizes himself. I move that the committee reconsider the vote on the amendment by Mr. Pitts, numbered 1001. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, state his point of order. I think you have to take us through the sequence here because I can't recollect whether the roll call was already over when you asked to change your vote. I would like the parliamentarian to give me the sequence and when you suddenly, because you voted one way and you changed that vote, but I wasn't sure whether it was. I can assure the gentleman I did it in a timely fashion. I had asked if any member wished to change his or her vote, and then I changed my vote. 
Then the clerk tallied the vote. All I right, move Mr. the reconsideration. All right, Mr. Chairman, I'll take your word for it. The vote now comes on reconsidering Mr. the Chairman. vote on the amendment by Mr. Pitts. Uh, but what rules? The, the motion is uh, the vote is on the motion to reconsider the vote on the amendment by Mr. Pitts. Would then bring the amendment back before. Mr. Chairman, point of order. The gentleman state his point of order. What rule? What do you mean? Uh, House rule or, or this committee rule, yeah. are you relying on to have the right to vote, to move to reconsider the vote by which the vote was taken? A member who votes in the prevailing side on an amendment may offer a motion to reconsider the vote. What is the rule? What's the ruler? Uh, point to the rule that you're relying on. Clause 3 of Rule 29. Now, if I can find a damn rule book. <laughs> <laughs> what, the, what did you say? All those in favor of the motion to reconsider will say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. <coughs> the ayes have it. On well, that, I would ask for a roll call. Okay, vote. let's go to a roll call vote. This is on the vote to reconsider. This is not on the underlying substantive vote. It's on the procedural vote to reconsider. Is that correct? Tell me it's correct. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Aye. Aye. Mr. Dingle votes aye. Mr. Markey. Aye. Mr. Markey, aye. Mr. Boucher. Aye. I'm sorry, Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Aye. Mr. Pallone, aye. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Aye. Mr. Rush, aye. Ms. Eshoo. Aye. Ms. Eshoo, aye. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Engel. Aye. Mr. Engel, aye. Mr. Green. Aye. Mr. Green, aye. Ms. DeGette. Aye. Ms. DeGette, aye. Mrs. Capps. Aye. Mrs. Capps, aye. Mr. Doyle. Yes. Mr. Doyle, aye. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon, aye. Ms. Schakowsky. Aye. Ms. Schakowsky, aye. aye. Mr. G Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Ms. Gonzalez, aye. Mr. Inslee. Aye. Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross. No. Mr. Ross, votes no. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, aye. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Butterfield. Aye. Mr. Butterfield, aye. Mr. Melanson. Aye. Mr. Melanson, aye. Mr. Barrow. Aye. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Mr. Hill. Aye. Mr. Hill, aye. Ms. Matsui. Aye. Ms. Matsui, aye. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Space. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, aye. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, votes aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, aye. Mr. Barton. Barton votes no. Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Hall, no. Mr. Upton. No. Mr. Upton, no. Mr. Stearns. No. Mr. Stearns, no. Mr. Deal. No. Mr. Deal, no. Mr. Whitfield. No. Mr. Whitfield, no. Mr. Shimkus. No. Mr. Shimkus, no. Mr. Shattuck. No. Mr. Shattuck, no. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, no. Mr. Boyer. No. Mr. Boyer, no. Mr. Radonovich. No. Mr. Radonovich, no. Mr. Pitts. No. Mr. Pitts, no. Ms. Bono Mack. No. Ms. Bono Mack, no. Mr. Walden. No. Mr. Walden, no. Mr. Terry. No. Mr. Terry, no. Mr. Rogers. No. 
Mr. Rogers, no. Mrs. Myrick, Mrs. Myrick, no. Mr. Sullivan, no. Mr. Sullivan, no. Mr. Murphy, Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Burgess, no. Ms. Blackburn, no. Ms. Blackburn, no. Mr. Gingry, no. Mr. Gingry, no. Mr. Scully, no. Mr. Scully, no. Mr. Murphy, okay. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut votes aye. Mr. Space. Aye. Mr. Space votes aye. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Stupak. No. Mr. Stupak votes no. Will the clerk call the roll of members who have not responded? Mr. Gordon. Any member wish to change? Mr. Gordon votes aye. Any member wish to uh, change his or, his or her vote? Mr. Ross. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Ross has voted as I. I'm sorry, as no. I apologize. Okay. Off no and on I. Clerk will tally the vote and announce it. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, the A's were 35, the nays were 24. 35 ayes, 24 noes. The motion to reconsider is approved. The matter before us now is the amendment by Mr. Pitts, numbered 1 001. The motion, the amendment is before us. We'll now proceed to a vote on the amendment. All those in favor of the Pitts Amendment will answer aye. When the roll is, call when the roll is called, we'll, guys, we'll just go to a roll call. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingle. No. Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher? No. Mr. Boucher, no. Mr. Pallone? No. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Gordon? Mr. Rush? No. Mr. Rush votes no. Ms. Eshoo? No. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak? Yes. Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Engel? No. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green? Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Gett? Mr. Gett votes no. Mrs. Capps? Mrs. Capps votes no. Mr. Doyle? Mr. Doyle votes no. Ms. Harmon? Ms. Harmon, no. 
Ms. Schakowsky? No. Ms. Schakowsky votes no. Mr. Gonzalez? No. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee? No. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin? No. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross? Yes. Mr. Ross votes aye. Mr. Weiner? No. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson? Aye. Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Butterfield? No. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson? Yes. Mr. Melanson, aye. Mr. Barrow? Aye. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Mr. Hill? Aye. Mr. Hill, aye. Ms. Matsui? No. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen? No. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor? Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes? Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut? No. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space? No. Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney? Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Ms. Sutton? No. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley? No. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch? No. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton? Aye. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall? Aye. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton? Aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns? Votes aye. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal? Votes aye. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield? Aye. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus? Aye. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck? Votes aye. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt? Aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer? Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich? Aye. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts? Aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack? Aye. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden? Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry? Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers? Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick? Aye. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy, Pennsylvania? Aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess? Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mrs. Blackburn? Aye. Mrs. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry? Aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise? Aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. Any member wish to be recorded? Mr. Gordon. No. Mr. Gordon votes no. Any member wish to change his or her vote? If not, the clerk will tally the vote. Yes. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 29 ayes and 30 noes. 29 ayes, 30 noes, the amendment's not agreed to. Bye-bye, somebody. Who seeks recognition for an amendment? Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. It's labeled uh, Burgess number 30. Could you, could you tell us what division that is? The division? I believe it's Division A. A, thank you. It's to Section 223. Are they passing out talking points? 
should have loved you for this one. Yeah. Okay. We have the, Mr. Chairman, we have the amendment. The Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Burgess of Texas. Continue reading. Clerk will read the amendment. Strike section 223 and insert the following section. Page 223, negotiated rates. A in general. Subject to, subject to subsection B, the secretary shall negotiate payment rates for the public health insurance option. I'd ask the amendment to be considered as read. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a few moments ago in this hearing, we defeated an amendment by Dr. Burgess uh, to strike the public plan. Many of us are deeply concerned about the creation of that public plan. Indeed, many doctors across America are very concerned that that, that public plan will reimburse doctors at Medicare rates. I think many of us are aware that uh, doctors across America cannot practice at Medicare rates. And indeed, in many communities across the country, it's impossible to find a doctor who will take new Medicare patients. And doctors are more and more saying they won't do that. They will no longer accept patients on Medicare because they simply cannot accept the reimbursement. All of us as members of Congress uh, are besought each year by doctors who come in and see us and ask for an update of their payment. Uh, we struggle that issue each year. I think it would be inappropriate if costs were shifted from this public plan onto the private plan. And so my amendment simply says that the secretary shall negotiate the payment rates for providers under the public insurance option with all health care suppliers and providers, and that it shall do so without any reference, the Secretary shall do so without any reference to the Medicare rates. The committee's not in order. Gentlemen will suspend. Committee, please come to order. Gentlemen is recognized. It was the buzzers that made it not in order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, the essence of this amendment is simply to say that the reimbursement rates under the new public plan need to be negotiated. They need to be negotiated independently and fairly. They need to be negotiated separately from Medicare uh, so that doctors, are re doctors and other providers are reimbursed on a fair rate and so that the creation of the public option does not result in a cost shifting from the public option to the private sector. Uh, many on the other side have said that uh, they think that public option is vitally important it can't be fair if it is allowed to cost shift. Uh, that is to say that if it does not fully reimburse doctors and other providers for their services, and they have to then go get paid out of the private carriers that are still in the market. This is a simple, straightforward pr protecting amendment. I believe the American Medical Association made it very clear that it thought uh, reimbursing doctors under the new public option plan on Medicare rates uh, would not adequately compensate them and would cause doctors not to want to participate in and or practice under that. And with that, I'd be happy to yield to my colleague, uh, Dr. Burgess. Yeah, I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I, I, I thank him for, uh, for this amendment. You've heard me say it so many times, how our doctors are struggling to pay their bills under current Medicare reimbursement rates. They are able to offset some of their losses treating our seniors with higher rates they've negotiated with private plans. But this will cease to be the case with millions being pushed into the public plan. And once again, once again, we're going to have coverage without access. Any public plan ought to have to negotiate its payment rates and build its own network of providers, just as the private system currently does, in order to ensure that there's a level playing field for patients and providers. Mr. Chairman, I oppose the establishment of a public plan. But if Congress must do so, we must make sure that it will be as fair as possible to all parties involved. I have serious concerns that if Congress is to enact a public option, it will decide to link the reimbursement rates to those already established in other government-run plans, Medicare and Medicaid. If we force physicians to accept the Medicare rate, this will result in a serious lack of participating providers and therefore we should be even more concerned that this could eventually be uh, linked to limited access for our patients. Uh, 
reclaiming my time, I'd like to briefly yield to Mr. Rogers and then to Dr. Gingrey. That, thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. You know, I used to be an FBI agent in Chicago, and the Chicago mob used to go into these businesses and say, for whatever good or whatever service, I'm going to pay you 50 cents on the dollar. Oh, and by the way, if you don't comply, I'm going to do something really awful. And I look at this bill, and by the way, as an FBI agent, I'd go, great, good case. That's extortion. Can't wait to get a hold of it. In this bill, the federal government goes into these doctors and says, I'm going to pay you 80, 80 cents on the dollar, and oh, by the way, if you don't comply, I'm going to do something really awful to you. I don't know what the difference is, but we're going to get ready to do it again to these doctors. Millions of people are going to be pushed into this government plan, and doctors are going to be reimbursed less than it costs to provide the service. And there is no, no consideration in this bill to fix that very huge problem. It means you'll get a card and have nowhere to go to get it serviced. I yield back my time. Time has expired. Chair recognizes himself in opposition to the amendment. This amendment is not the same as the uh, provision in the Senate Help Committee. It is only an amendment by itself on this subject. I think in and of itself we should not support this amendment. It might well be something that some members can support in a broader context, but I would urge members to vote against it as it now stands. Mr. Chair. I, I yield uh, to Mr. Barton. I just want to speak in support of it, and I'll be as brief as you were in opposition. What this does is say you can't, try, you can't tie rates on the uh, public plan uh, to Medicare rates. That's the plain and simple of it. And um, there are a lot of members on both sides of the aisle on this committee who have said that they um, oppose tying the pu public plan rate in any shape, form, or fashion to Medicare rates. And if you've said that and you believe it, then you should vote for Mr. Shattuck's amendment. Gentleman, yield. Um, it's actually Mr. Waxman's time. Who seeks? Uh, Mr. Gingrich, yeah. I'll yield to you. Mr. Chairman, I think what the uh, and I thank you for yielding. I think what the ranking member said is exactly right. There are members on both sides of the aisle who have very uh, clearly uh, stated their opposition to uh, the payment of Medicare rates and the public option, and they've, they've expressed their opposition to requiring providers to participate in the public option uh, if they are allowed to continue to participate in Medicare. Uh, actuarial firm uh, Milliman Incorporated. Uh, uh, estimated that, that the cost shifting uh, to an average family would be $1,800. Uh, there is no question that this, uh, this cost will be passed on, and I think it may be the, uh, the single most important ca cause of uh, runaway cost, inflation, uh, inflationary cost of, uh, of, of health care is this cost shifting. And, and, I, and I think the gentleman from Arizona is absolutely right. I wholeheartedly support the amendment. I'm ready to proceed to a vote, but this is Mr. Burgess's amendment. Do you want to close on it? I appreciate uh, the, the consideration. I, I, I really would urge an I vote on this. I think it's terribly important, but in the hour is late. Let's go to the vote and get it done. Okay. That we, we'll now proceed to a vote, and uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. Uh, no. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. What's no? Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. No. Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. No. Mr. Rush, no. Mr. Eng I'm sorry, Ms. Eshu. Ms. Eshu. Ms. Eshu votes no. Mr. Stupak? No. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel? No. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green? Ms. Get. No. Mr. Get, no. Mrs. Caps? No. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle? No. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon? No. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Chapowski? No. Ms. Chapowski, no. Mr. Gonzalez? Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee? Ms. Baldwin? No. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross? Mr. Weiner? No. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson? No. 
Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Butterfield? Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Malinson? Yes. Mr. Malinson, aye. Mr. Barrow? Aye. Mr. Barrow, aye. Mr. Hill? Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui? Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen? Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor? Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes? Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut? No. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space? Aye. Mr. Space? Aye. Mr. McNerney? Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton? No. Ms. Sutton? No. Mr. Braley? No. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch? Mr. Barton? Aye. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall? Aye. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton? Aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns? Both aye. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal? Aye. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield? Aye. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus? Aye. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck? Both aye. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Plunk? Aye. Mr. Blunt? Aye. Mr. Boyer? Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich? Aye. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts? Aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bonomack? Aye. Ms. Bonomack, aye. Mr. Walden? Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry? Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick, Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry? Aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise? Aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Boucher? Aye. Mr. Boucher, aye. Mr. Green? No. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Inslee? No. Mr. Inslee, no. Mr. Markey? No. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Welch? No. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. 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 Gordon? Aye. Mr. Gordon, no. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Gordon, I. Clerk, call the roll of the names of the of the members who have not yet voted. Mr. Ross. All right. Anybody wish to change your vote? Including the chairman. How many times do I have to change my vote? Clerk will report the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there were 29 ayes and 29 noes. 29 ayes, 29 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Ms. Matsui, you have an amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Matsui 8-001. Clerk will report the amendment. Sorry. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute off 
to H.R. 3200, offered by Ms. Matsui of California and Mr. Green of Texas. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentlelady from California is recognized for five minutes. The Mansui Green Amendment contains language that will help preserve adult day health care services. Mr. Chairman, the committee is not in order. The committee will please come to order. Members are entitled to be heard. Thank you, Mr. Gentlelady Chairman. from California. Thank you. The Matsui Green Amendment contains language that will help preserve adult day health care services for thousands of low-income seniors across our country. Adult day health care services are community-based daytime programs that provide health and preventive services to the frail elderly. Seniors who participate in adult day health programs are less likely to go to the emergency Would room. Would Gentlelady yield? Yes. Um, we're prepared to accept it if you will yield to uh, Mr. Whitfield to support it. Certainly, I'll yield. I'll also, okay, certainly. Does the general yield lady yield? Yes, I will. Let okay. me yield to Mr. Green first. And, and I agree that I'll yield back enough time, but uh, I want to thank my colleague for her amendment. Uh, this is part of, a, part of that amendment. So I'm a co-sponsor of Ms. Matsui's amendment on adult daycare, which is great. But uh, this is an in-block amendment, or amendment including H.R. 1392. And I want to thank uh, both Representative DeGette, Representative Whitfield, Representative Sutton, Ross, Terry, Gordon, and Hall for working with us on it. It's a, uh, uh, it's a prompt pay discounts extended to wholesalers at contract terms, something we've worked out together. And with that, if uh, Ms. Matsui would uh, also, since it's her time, yield to my colleague from New York. Certainly. Let me I, I thank the gentleman, and I'll be, I'll be very, very brief. I, I just want to uh, add my support to the adult day health care amendment. I was very proud to co-sponsor this with Mrs. Matsui to protect the adult day health care programs in eight states, including my home state of New York. It's a very, very important program from New York. This amendment has no cost, and it's a win for everyone, and I'm just delighted uh, that we are uh, hopefully passing this now, and I would yield back to Mrs. Matsui. And with that, I'd like to yield to Mr. Whitfield. Well, I want to thank the gentlelady from California and gentlemen from Texas for their efforts on this amendment. And I want to thank uh, Ranking Member Barton for accepting it. It simply removes an, an, an inequity in the reimbursement to physicians for the medicines they use in treating cancer patients. It's a serious problem, and I'm delighted that uh, the members will accept this amendment. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe I'll yield back the balance of my time. Generally, yields back the balance of her time. Are we ready for the question? All those in favor of the Matsui Amendment, Matsui Green Amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the amendment's agreed to. Mr. Barton? Yes, um, I'd like to engage in a colloquy with the Chairman. Gentlemen's recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding that we're prepared now to recess subject to the call of the chair and then it's your uh, inclination to reconvene the committee at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, when we do reconvene at 10 a.m., will the bill be open to amendment at any point, including A, B, and C? We'll uh, stay with A and B, and then after that we will open it up. And how long do you intend to continue the markup? Um, and my understanding is that the House is going to uh, uh, finish its business in terms of recorded votes sometime between 12 and 1 p.m. Well, we're going to stay as long as it takes. And I want members to please arrange their schedule to recognize this is a very important uh, matter before us. Uh, we don't just have a committee mark up and then quit when the House is no longer in session. If we can move uh, faster, we'll move faster. But however long it takes, we've got to complete this legislation. So it's your, your inclination that even once the House adjourns, as long as there are amendments that members wish to offer, that uh, we could be here until midnight Friday night if necessary. I don't anticipate we'll be here until uh, midnight Friday night. I would urge the members to think carefully about their priorities for amendments, and we ought to limit the time limit maybe even more than 
what we did today, although it was helpful to have the time limits that we had today, but I think we ought to uh, move as expeditiously and as fairly as possible tomorrow and complete the bill. Well, Mr. Chairman, I do believe that the um, time limitation today, 10 minutes on each side, uh, works very well. We, the sponsor got to speak and then we had several members on each side get to speak. We were able to have enough debate that the issues were fleshed out, but not, we, I don't think we drug it out on any of them. Uh, and on many amendments, especially those that we were in agreement in, we, we moved through them very expeditiously. So I, I think our process today uh, has worked well, and uh, I hope that we will consider that or some very similar version of it tomorrow. I uh, am, am ready to stand by uh, the unanimous consent agreement that we have for 10 minutes on each side, but I want members to understand that at some point we're going to end this uh, markup, and I would hate to leave members without an opportunity to offer their amendments. Yeah. But we'll do all that we can uh, to accommodate members, uh, but we're not going to stay here until midnight tomorrow night. Yeah. And Mr. Chairman, it, the last thing I would indicate to the members of the, uh, the minority that we will have a uh, pre-meeting uh, at 9.30 in the, in the Republican lounge. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General, uh, Mr. Martin has informed his members that you'll have a pre-meeting tomorrow, tomorrow morning at 930. 9.30. We will uh, come back to session promptly at 10 in this room, and we now stand in recess. Secretary of State Clinton travels to Africa next week. We'll get an update on the trip next. After that, a U.S. Special Envoy testifies about the situation in Sudan. That Senate Foreign Relations...